Okay, we like to call the meeting of the State Board of Higher Education to order. Uh, Christy, would you te please take the roll? Board Chair Diedrich. Here. Mr. Espigard. Dr. Jelmstead. Here. Ms. Hoffer. Here. Mr. Hoffer. Here. Mr. Martin. Here. Mr. Munsky. Dr. Munsky is present. Ms. Nessett. Here. Ms. Reichert. Here. Mr. Schaft. Schaft is here. Dwayne. Uh, is Dwayne, are you online? No, okay. Madam Chair, if I may, before we get started, just a technical issue, just to remind everybody, because this is the only second time we've had this, uh, microphones, if the red light's on, you're being picked up, and this is all being live streamed. And uh, if the red light's off, you're not being picked up so that you're not saying something that's going over live stream. So just a reminder uh, of that. And once again, I wanna thank Bismarck State College. You can see all the equipment that's sitting in here. Um, uh, and, and by the way, during breaks, I recommend you go over and take a look at how they've got this thing set up. It is really, if, you, if you're a tech guy, you would really appreciate all the technology that goes into this. So, um, but at any rate, just, just the reminder. Okay, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, first on the agenda, uh, approval of the January 30th, 2014 minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? So approved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Christy? Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Ms. Nessett? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Schaft? Schaft votes yes. Mr. Espigard? Board Chair Diedrich. Diedrich votes yes. Okay. Item number two, approval of the agenda. And before we do approve the agenda, I'm going to poll item 11, and the Chancellor will tell us the reason why. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's a lot of spinning plates on this. First, it's the annual budget. It's not the biennial budget, so it's going forward in our current biennium. And there were some issues yesterday, you may have seen some criticism, actually criticism against the board, and, and I apologize for that. It shouldn't be against the board until you take an action on the thing, it's staff work. And so we as a staff put the agenda together and then, uh, and then send it out. And until you take action on it, there should be no criticism of you. But uh, nevertheless, there was uh, some issues on there. Uh, we need to staff a little better on the tuition. Uh, there was some uh, information taken out of context that actually had to do with fees and not tuition, but it was quoted as being part of the tuition discussion. So we need to clarify that. Also, I've been working very closely with NDSA on the Connect ND fee and that was in there and uh, we have now come to a conclusion that we can in fact, as the NDSA uh, group has asked us, um, we can decrease that fee so we're pulling that, uh, that's being part of the budget and so uh, we're giving a lot of good news, uh, Ms. Vetter, uh, for the NDSA on, uh, on being able to reduce that uh, Connect ND fee. So that's the second reason and then the third and I think the most important reason when I talk to the chair about the budget is she wants this budget reviewed by the Budget and Finance Committee, which you are all going to approve today, the policy that reestablishes that committee. So in fairness, to get that back to the Budget and Finance Committee. So for all those reasons, um, I've recommended to the chair that uh, item number 11 be pulled. Thank you, all ma'am. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on, it is the board chair's report. And I'd like to say welcome and what Madam, an ex- Madam Chair, oh. I'm sorry, to approve the oh. agenda. Oh, sorry. I'm just so excited to talk about Steve Shirley. I just can't wait. <laughs> I don't blame you. All right. Motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Ms. Nessett? Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Okay. Now I can talk about the exciting day at Minot State University. Uh, today we appointed Dr. Stephen Shirley as the ninth president of Minot State. And I feel like I should say congratulations and welcome home. <laughs> On another note, we have a very full agenda today. And some of the people in the room would like to get back for a Founders Day celebration in Grand Forks. So I'm going to keep my comments rather brief, but I do want to give you a couple of highlights. 
Uh, this month, Dr. Munsky, Don Morton, Dr. Chelmsted, and I attended the second of four joint boards meetings where we're working in a collaborative effort to move forward the idea of a P20 education system in North Dakota. This is very exciting. Um, our first meeting, we discussed the fact that we needed to meet more often to actually put some meat into this initiative, and it's been wonderful working with the other boards. Um, I also, along with the Chancellor and System Office staff, attended the Higher Ed Funding Committee meeting hosted by North Dakota State College of Science, where we discussed the funding model and had the opportunity to share the many successes of our two-year institutions. And I'd like to thank Dr. Richmond for hosting us at that event. And then yesterday, the Roles and Responsibilities Task Force met to review and discuss the responsibility matrix, the draft of the Roles and Responsibility Task Force report, and we also heard a presentation by past Chancellor Larry Isaac where he gave us a historical perspective of the university system. I have to say this is a great time to be in North Dakota and we'll be sharing even more of our plans on how to bring the university system to the next level later in this meeting. So with that, that is the end of my report and I'd like to move on to item four, uh, Dr. Skogan, the Chancellor's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you know, we began uh, having presentations from the institutions on what we're calling institutional initiatives. And typically those have followed my report, uh, but um, Dr. Uh, Denver Tolliver, is, who's going to be giving this report to you now on the uh, um, Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute of NDSU, and he's got to catch a plane. So we moved him to the very front, and uh, so um, Dr. Tolliver, if you want to come and give your presentation, we'd appreciate it very much. Thank you. Skogan for this invitation to uh, address the board and thank you for the time uh, today I'd like to talk I realize you have a close agenda uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, very quickly give you an overview of NDSU's Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute uh, the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute uh, UGPTI for short was established by the legislature in 1967 as a specialized uh, research institute at North Dakota State University. The enabling legislation also created an advisory council, which I will talk a little bit more about in just a moment. The original intent was to uh, establish uh, an objective entity that would study the effects of transportation and transportation limitations uh, on the state's economy, economy and particularly on the marketing of goods and the capability of North Dakota producers uh, to distribute our products in distant markets. And North Dakota being located uh, far distances from the east and the west coast and the population centers, transportation cost and transportation efficiency were major concerns. So much of our early work kind of focused on access, access to markets and uh, particularly railroad access to markets uh, Chicago and uh, some of the grain, uh, major grain markets, but also the east and the west coast. And that's still one of our primary focus areas, and particularly with respect to uh, uh, oil and uh, grain, some of our other uh, products. But we also have uh, evolved into a comprehensive research center uh, that focuses on all modes of transportation, but especially on surface transportation. And uh, we originally started out basically uh, looking at marketing and economics, but we have very much of a multidisciplinary staff now. We have civil engineers, industrial engineers, supply chain specialists, uh, policy specialists. Uh, so we really cover all modes and all facets of transportation. Our main offices are located uh, on the Fargo campus, but we also have an office here in Bismarck, and we have uh, an office in Lakewood, Colorado, which specializes in motor carrier safety analysis. Uh, we are also the lead uh, institution in an organization called the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes eight universities uh, in our region, 
uh, three in the state of Colorado, two in the state of Utah, Wyoming, and uh, South Dakota. Uh, we are the lead university, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Mountain Plains Consortium later. Uh, this is a list of our advisory council members. Uh, we usually meet uh, two, three times a year. The role of the council is to provide us with uh, broad guidance and support. We had an extended session in October, a strategic planning session, and we engaged our council members and they identified uh, what they thought were the five or six most critically important emerging issues that, uh, that we could focus on more and develop into the future. Uh, the chair of our committee right now is from the Associ Association of General Contractors in North Dakota, uh, Russ Hansen. I spoke earlier about the Mountain Plains Consortium. We're one of the competitively selected uh, university transportation centers. Uh, there are 10 federal regions, uh, and we are the center for federal region eight. Uh, in addition to uh, NDSU, which leads the consortium, we have three universities in Colorado, two in Utah, University of Wyoming, South Dakota State University. Our primary focus is on uh, transportation infrastructure and safety although we do conduct a lot of research on intermodal freight transportation. Uh, a couple of the universities in the consortium, particularly University of Denver and University of Colorado Denver, focus on metropolitan planning and uh, traffic analysis. So we think it's a very balanced uh, consortium and, and, and a very good partnership that covers the entire region. In fact, USDOT has commented several times that they think we have the best consortium in the nation because we blend our strengths together and we bring a lot more uh, to the table so this, the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, we also engage in technology transfer and uh, extensive workforce development. Uh, perhaps our best known uh, research efforts in North Dakota relate to road and bridge infrastructure and we're we are in our third study for the governor and the North Dakota legislature. And what we do is we forecast uh, truck traffic across the state for the next 20 to 25 years on a year by year uh, basis. And we do very detailed modeling of the oil industry and uh, agricultural related uh, transportation and logistics. Uh, we model the predicted uh, trips down at the individual spacing unit for oil and at the township level for crop uh, production. And once we estimate all of these uh, trips each year, uh, then we assign them to the highway system and we estimate the truck trips and axle loads on individual road segments. And this is the primary source of information that the legislature uses to estimate uh, funding needs for county and township roads. And so for the last two sessions, the legislature has appropriated incremental funds. Uh, we're reporting to two interim committees and we'll have our final study done in June and we're scheduled on the July 8th uh, agenda for the uh, Energy Development and Transmission Committee. That time we'll be presenting our, our final results and we'll also be briefing the governor's chief of staff uh, that same week. And so once we estimate all this traffic, we project uh, how much funding is needed uh, by biennium for the 20, 25 year period. And this is a major improvement over traditional methods. Uh, what we used to do 15, 20 years ago was we would count the traffic on a road uh, three, four, five years, and then we would trend that into the future. That doesn't tell you anything about what's happening in Western North Dakota. That trend line means nothing, and not only does it mean nothing now, uh, it may change uh, completely uh, based on drilling activities and all sorts of other changes in the technology. Uh, we also developed the traffic models that the North Dakota DOT uses to predict uh, the traffic flows over their highways and uh, we also provide uh, them with a detailed analysis of all investment needs for all state highways uh, for again for the 20 year period and they use this to uh, in testimony before the legislature to estimate the state uh, funding needs and we also do a lot of technical assistance for counties uh, and townships I'll talk a little bit more about that later on I don't want you to think that we just focus on highways because we also look at railroad transportation. As I'll talk about a little bit later, we have a freight, training, uh, uh, freight uh, transportation program. Uh, we have uh, a traffic analysis center on campus in uh, Fargo, and uh, we provide technical and planning sis assistance to small and medium-sized cities, particularly to the MPOs in North Dakota and also to the North Dakota DOT, which needs to plan their highways uh, in urban areas. 
Uh, we have some uh, pretty sophisticated models here. We have most of the traffic simulation models that uh, are used by Federal Highway Administration and most of the state DOTs. We do the travel demand modeling for the MPOs to help them predict their traffic again uh, year by year, 20 years into the future. Uh, we help them uh, implement intelligent transportation systems uh, solutions to reduce congestion and uh, improve safety. And we also collect a lot of data ourselves. And in 2013, we actually collected traffic at about 1,100 locations uh, around the state, mostly on county and township roads. So we have a really good idea of what the traffic pattern is out there. And we make this uh, information available to counties and to anyone else who wants to use it. And in fact, I think uh, I interact with a lot of other folks from uh, universities around the state through committees. I think we got the best county and township uh, uh, database in the United States for, at least for rural roads. Uh, our original focus was agricultural and freight transportation, and we still focus uh, highly on that. Uh, a lot of it is economic analysis of railroad truck and intermodal transportation options. And particularly, we look at the service levels, the markets, uh, industry practices, uh, what are the costs of moving goods from North Dakota to other areas of the country by different types of car and different uh, shipment levels. And then we also provide shippers with information that is useful for their logistics planning. Uh, the North Dakota DOT is going to be undertaking a freight planning process. In fact, uh, well, they're far into it right now. And we're going to be helping them and providing them with technical assistance along the way. Over the last five to six years, we have uh, strongly developed our technology application and, and deployment uh, dimension of UGPTI. And originally, we focused on RFID and applications of RFID and locating rail cars and, and vehicles and an inventory management. But we've moved more into looking at advancements in low power sensors combined with wireless communications and uh, mobile computing to provide almost real time information about not only shipments, but traffic patterns, uh, conditions of pavements, uh, structures, et cetera. And one of the examples is that uh, we spend a lot of time uh, collecting pavement roughness information, something called the International Roughness Index, where we drive a vehicle all over the roads. That's very time consuming and labor intensive. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're instrumenting vehicles uh, with sensors and accelerometers. And when the vehicles drive over the pavement, uh, we measure the roughness instantaneously and, and we have smartphone applications then that will transmit that back and we can capture the data immediately. The road conditions are changing very rapidly in western North Dakota and we think this has a lot of potential, a lot of application and hopefully five years from now we'll be seeing this all over the road, where all over the state where state vehicles and even industry vehicles are such uh, equipped. We have a specialized center for the North Dakota Department of Transportation on campus. And uh, we, sometimes what the North Dakota DOT uh, wants is they want some very quick, fast studies. They have a major problem they didn't understand. And so they need something in three, four, five months. And so we provide this quick response uh, research capability to them, primarily in highway engineering and planning. Uh, we also have a student uh, roadway design section so we'll recruit on campus and probably have maybe eight to 10 junior, senior civil engineering students working under the direction of two North Dakota DOT employees who are stationed on campus with us. And they actually do design projects for the DOT in their junior and senior years. And the DOT uses the projects. Uh, the students get great real life uh, experience and the North Dakota DOT gets to meet them. They get to understand the organization. So it's really a win-win uh, situation. Uh, we also have the local technical assistance uh, program. And that's uh, operated out of our Bismarck office here. And it's part of a nationwide network that focuses on the exchange of information on transportation technology, uh, particularly among local units of government, uh, county, township, and, and small cities. Uh, through this, through the LTAP, we provide a lot of training and technical assistance. And uh, three years ago, we added a special program for Western North Dakota. And we have people that go around the counties and visit with the county engineers and the road managers and give them technical assistance, particularly those that are heavily impacted by uh, uh, oil-related traffic. 
And we also have a, a transportation learning network uh, office, which is also headquartered here in Bismarck. Um, this is a workforce uh, training initiative. And uh, in addition to the eight universities that I mentioned earlier, we have four state transportation departments uh, that are partners in this transportation learning network. And so we develop training, sometimes professional certification, but, but it could be training, professional development for engineers, and we uh, provide access uh, to that through a wide range of media. I mean, we can do video conferences, but that's really not the norm. Uh, we have regular webinars. We have an entire series of online modules. And what the DOTs use this for is they'll, they'll hire somebody with uh, maybe a, uh, an associate degree, uh, doesn't have really background transportation. We very quickly go through like almost a year sequence of technical trainings on some of the fundamental concepts that they're going to need. And I think we have a pretty unique learning management system because the employees, the DOT employees, can log into the system and the system tracks them, it sets their training goals, and then it monitors progress towards those training goals by virtue of the modules that they have taken. Uh, most people don't realize this, but we write and develop and maintain almost all of the software that the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration uses. Uh, and all of the inspectors in the North Dakota Highway Patrol and most of the highway patrols around the United States actually use this software uh, when they stop vehicles and inspect them in the field for safety, uh, whether it be at port of entry, at way stations, or actually uh, anywhere. We also write a lot of the software that uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration use when they go visit the motor carrier company itself. And so if a motor carrier company has a, uh, a record of out-of-service violations, then their inspectors will go on site. And we have about five, six specialized pieces of software that they use when they are out there. And uh, we're very interested then in safety-related search that will improve the targeting of motor carrier safety enforcement, and that is isolate on those companies and isolate on those drivers and those vehicles and those areas where there are problems. And one of the things we're looking at is wireless roadside inspection, where we capture all the information that's generated uh, by the truck that's coming in, not just in the locomotive, not just in the, the, the tractor itself, but sometimes the trailers has sensor information information on braking system, tire pressure, all of that stuff, we can capture that, send it to a wayside location, and then those vehicles and those companies that are compliant, they just go on by, we don't stop them, we don't impede uh, the commerce. That's still a couple of years away, but we're working on it. Uh, we also have a uh, transit center that specializes in small and urban uh, uh, rural transit, and some of the example studies that we've done are coordination of transit systems in the state, uh, applications of ITS uh, to uh, transit systems, and, and mobility planning. Uh, we also uh, collaborate with uh, the North Dakota DOT and the Federal Highway Administration uh, on a wide variety of safety and security research, and uh, we have recently established a transportation safety advisory committee that includes the director of the North Dakota DOT, the superintendent of the North Dakota Highway Patrol, the director of the North Dakota Department of Emergency Services, and the division directors for Federal Motor Carrier Safety, Federal Railroad Administration, Federal Highway Administration, and the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration. And we'll be developing a two-year uh, plan, a program of research, uh, education, outreach, and technical assistance. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Chancellor Skogan, the reason I have to leave uh, quickly is I'm making a presentation to the Safety Council of the US DOT in Washington, DC tomorrow morning. Very concerned about transportation safety uh, in North Dakota, particularly uh, related to movement of, of crude oil and, uh, and energy related activity in the Bakken. So we will be continuing with a lot of activities uh, we also coordinate uh, NDSU's uh, multidisciplinary education programs through the Transportation and Logistics program. We offer a PhD. Uh, we also offer the Master of Managerial Logistics degree, and we're going completely online with this degree through a um, cooperative agreement with Army Logistics University at Fort Lee. And Army Logistics University views us as the premier uh, logistics program for military log logisticians in the United States. 
they invited us to offer the program on Fort Lee. Uh, that wasn't practical, but we're going online, and so wherever the soldiers are around the world, active duty, military, reservist, they can take our program, take it online, and we're very, very excited about this, and uh, we're looking forward to hopefully growing that into uh, the premier program in the United States. We also have an online Master's of Transportation Urban Systems and a Transportation Leadership Graduate Certificate program, and I realize I'm going over time, so I'm going to quickly <laughs> move through here. We have a long-term commitment to tribal transportation planning and outreach, and uh, we partner with uh, North Dakota DOT and the tribal, trans uh, tran uh, tribal technical assistance programs, as well as some of the tribes, and we're making a big safe uh, a push on uh, not only roadway management, but tribal transportation safety, uh, and we're going to be putting some substantial resources into that. Uh, some Very quickly, some emerging areas. Um, uh, we do work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, when they look at making a waterway investment, uh, for example, replacing a lock in the upper Mississippi River system, we model the effects of them not making that investment, which means it goes by rail or it goes by truck or something. And then we also maintain most of their models, including their barge cost uh, model. Uh, we have a great collaboration with the Aerospace Center of UND, and we put in quite a few collaborative proposals uh, together, and, and we're bringing the air services planning uh, capabilities to this partnership, and we're also very interested in partnering with them on potential uh, UAS applications. And uh, uh, Chancellor Skogan, thank you so much for the invitation. I realize I've gone over time, and so with that, I will stop. Thank you, Dr. Tolliver. Um, I found this presentation absolutely fascinating when he gave it. So often and when we talk about higher education, we think about undergraduate education, you know, English 110 and college algebra and those sorts of things. And to have this presentation from Dr. Tolliver that talks about not only the logistics and transportation in the state of North Dakota, but nationally, to know that NDSU is in Lakewood, Colorado, helping national safety transportation efforts was just to, fascinating to me, and I thought you would all find it equally fascinating. I don't know if anybody has any questions at all. Okay, thank, thank you, you so you. much. Okay. Thank you, and safe travels. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My uh, second initiative to talk about, and oh. okay. Thank you, Dwayne. We've got you down. Secondly, and, and uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, I uh, emailed out the, uh, the letter um, that the Legislative Council received on 5 January, in which the question was again posed to the Higher Learning Commission on what Measure 3 would do relative to accreditation in the state. And, um, and I would ask you to read closely the second and third paragraph of that letter. Um, where, in effect, a Higher Learning Commission is saying that we can't, we can't speculate on what the, uh, the accreditation issues will be because we don't know what it looks like if it passes. And the truth is, neither do we. Um, we know we, we would go from, uh, uh, from a board to uh, three commissioners. We know that. We know some of the, the mechanics of it, but it would require enabling legislation by the legislature between November and uh, 1 July when it would take effect. And uh, the Higher Learning Commission, in effect, is saying if it passes in November, then the enabling legislation is passed, then we will review the enabling legislation, we'll decide if there's an issue about accreditation. That's basically what the last letter says. So uh, I don't know, General Sogsveen, did I miss anything or anything you want to add to that? You didn't miss anything. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Any questions on that? I think, I think part of the issue too, Larry, is it not that, and maybe for Murray too, is that if the measure passes, there's still not a lot of finality to the mechanics until the, the legislative session that follows. And, and, and that's part of the problem is it's, it's, it, we don't even have a clear picture immediately after the vote. We don't really have a clear picture until the conclusion of the following session. That's correct. That Mr. Schaff, that's correct. The, uh, 
The measure, the vote is on November 4. The bill submission deadline for the legislature is December 4. But I realize you can uh, introduce legislation after that. So I've discussed the matter with the Legislative Council as to whether they are going to draft legislation in the event it might pass contingency legislation. The answer was no. So uh, we will, uh, I believe it's, it's appropriate that we internally draft implementing legislation just in case it passes. And you really don't know what, uh, how the implementation of that constitutional provision, what it will look like until it gets to the legislature. So I think the, uh, the Higher Learning Commission is unable to make a decision based on Constitutional Measure 3. They will have to wait until if Constitutional Measure 3 is passed and implementing legislation is passed before they can make a decision. And Chair uh, Murray, that's a little bit of a delicate dance in proposing legislation because <laughs> that, that could give the appearance of support for the measure too. So we have to... Well, the legislation would only, I mean, we, I think we have to be thinking about what the legislation Agreed. would look like just in case it passes because one month between November 4 and December 4 isn't enough time right. to, to go through the entire code to determine what needs to be changed uh, to transition from a board to a commission. Right. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions on that, I will move on to the next issue, which is an update on my uh, six goals. When you appointed me as your interim chancellor, you asked me to establish five goals and to provide uh, quarterly reports. So this is the first quarter since my appointment uh, in November. And uh, instead of five, uh, I gave you six, and so I'd like to give you a quick update on those six goals. Uh, first uh, was the North Dakota University System Communications Plan. Uh, I believe we have made great progress in accomplishing our goal to increase trust with our stakeholders as we communicate the board's vision to lead the nation in educational attainment. We kicked off with internal communications through a video message from me to all faculty and staff on November 1st, my first official day as your interim chancellor, followed by an editorial board tour to all major media outlet, uh, outlets in the state and wherever possible, I've also visited with faculty, staff, students, local legislators, and community members on the same trips. I've been on every campus since November 1, and on each visit have made a concerted effort to work with our campuses to schedule meetings with stakeholders that have ranged from small group meetings with representatives of constituents to large open forums where I've answered any and all questions asked. I've met several times with NDSA and various staff and faculty Senate members I send a video message to faculty and staff after every regular board meeting. I meet frequently with the governor and his team, as well as legislators and business and community leaders. I have given presentations to many groups around the state, ranging from the Greater North Dakota Chamber to the Dickinson Rotary Club to North Dakota United, the organization that represents 10,000 North Dakota education and public employees, and to a high school class. I have done dozens of television, radio, and newspaper interviews. We have increased communication with the presidents and dean of our institutions, and I believe have created an environment of trust and openness. Our cabinet and senior staff meetings are highly productive. I'm very proud of the leadership team that we have, and I think our communication within the team is effective. I believe we're making good progress in our communication with and to the board. Granted, we've been very careful. Uh, Mr. Uh, Schaff pointed that out at our last meeting. Uh, we've been very careful considering the open meetings violations in the past, but I think we're getting there. That's one of the reasons you are meeting more frequently, why our agendas are so full, and why are we are live webcasting the meetings. We are committed to transparency, and what is communicated at the meeting is truly the essence of the business at hand. It's this wonderful public organization, the State Board of Higher Education and North Dakota University System, along with our campuses doing its important work in full view of our stakeholders. And speaking of stakeholders, I'd like to show you our new video, which I believe demonstrates how we're changing the conversation about higher education in the state. 
We are preparing students for careers that will not only secure our state's success and improve our communities, but also in the long run, help make the world a better place. As we work on developing our strategies for the future, I think this video sets the tone and will be a great tool for all of us to use to help our audiences envision the possibilities on the horizon. And if we could have that played, please. Compliments to uh, Linda Donlan and all the members of the Public Affair Council that put this together. Um, the message of this, of course, is that education is important to our state and for our prosperity to our state. And then the individual branded institutions, of course, are, are what makes all that happen. So thank you for that. Um, the next uh, topic is pathways, and Dr. Sonia Cowan will be giving you a presentation on the wonderful work of our various task force working the issues of putting together recommendations for changes that you authorized at your last meeting. And Good morning, Chairman, <coughs> Madam Chairman, and members of the, of the board. It's my pleasure to give you an update, and I'm keeping the idea of it being at the 50,000 foot level. So it's very brief in terms of where we are in the work of three task forces assembled on the 19th of December, but they were unable to meet until actually the 6th of January. So we've done a lot of work in that period of time. Our first group to meet was uh, remedial de uh, slash developmental education via grade 12 of the public K-12 North Dakota schools, that's a very long name, task force after that. And then the admissions index uh, for six student success task force. And then we called the faculty who had been on leave during the break, uh, were able to meet with us starting in mid-January. And that's the best practices in remedial slash developmental education. We tried to uh, have at least eight people on each of these task forces representing each of the institutional types. Uh, that you've identified in pathways. We also had a student representation on our remedial education grade 12 task force and our admissions index task force. Uh, those were drawn from our uh, student association for those representatives that serve on the Academic Affairs Council and Student Affairs Council. We have a mix of academic and student affairs officers from each of those institutional types. And uh, we also have faculty. The faculty on the remedial education task force and the admissions index task force were identified by the Council for College Faculty. And um, our last task force, best practices in remedial education, is very heavily faculty stacked as well as representation from CCF on it. Collaboration is, is obviously uh, the word that and the concept that we're using as we approach the task force work. Uh, 
And out of collaboration, we know from what we find in the business world, that starts with cooperation, of identifying the problems and the issues that are before us. And then collective action. It's enough to identify the issues, but actually to take action. And to complete that, we uh, need to put in place a complex interdependence for going forward to a continue identifying issues and dealing with those. Remedial education has a number of targets, and so the first group we looked at was the first-time full-time college freshmen. We're looking at the career and college readiness approach that's being used by the K-12 schools in North Dakota. And um, Superintendent Baszler and I had an opportunity to meet in Washington, D.C. with some of the groups that are dealing with remedial education across the U.S. There is a program out of Tennessee that we looked at as a model and then developed with a task force some additions to that model. Those in our remedial education developmental task force via grade 12 include our state superintendent, academic officers, our student um, CCF, uh, Representative Suzanne Ross, Dr. Ross. We also included the superintendent of the Fargo schools and the dean of education, and I'll explain why as, we, as I give you a brief on that model. North Dakota uh, public schools graduated in the spring of 2013 out of their 148 high schools, 7,620 high school graduates, and of that number, 3,270 enrolled in our, our systems institutions as first-time, full-time college students this fall. And of that number, six, 864 had to take one or more uh, remedial college courses in math or English at our institutions. And you'll see the distribution of that number. 341 entered our community colleges, 242 of that number entered our regional colleges, and 122 entered our research institutions. They met the admission standards of those institutions, but still had remedial needs. They may be uh, very talented in other areas. They may have English as a second language, and they're escalating their skills very quickly, but at the time they were um, assessed upon entrance, then they had to go into those courses. So what can we do to help bridge that gap between leaving high school and entering college? And our approach is to look at the um, engagement of at least four primary partners in this process. The first uh, partner will be K-12. And we're looking at leveraging the senior year, pushing remedial education back to the K-12 so that the remediation takes place before they arrive <coughs> on our campuses. What we're looking at is moving remediation to the senior year so that we are in, uh, leveraging that senior year, but also giving opportunities for students who do not have remedial needs to then take an enhanced curricula and prepare also for the workforce at that time. So we are looking at a three-pronged approach at that uh, grade 12 is if they need remediation, they take the first semester to work in math and English remediation courses that will be assisted in the monitoring of their success by our community college faculty. Um, and I'll get in a little bit more detail, a little bit more detail. Um, they could also then, if they needed remediation, uh, spend that first semester remediation and then take, if they are successful in that remediation, take college courses in that second semester of their, their grade 12 year. So that they started off with remediation, but they have a success at the end of that year of already having college credits um, on their records. And then also in allowing them to have more engagement in the work and career experiences during that 12th grade year. I'm not supposed to get into the weeds, so I'm going to go, excuse me. Just a quick question. The, what is the identifier in their senior year as to where they're in need of remediation? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman and Mr. Schaff. You were the perfect segue to this slide. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, North Dakota Public Schools is putting in place a program called Smarter Balanced, and it will be in tandem with the um, core, the common core competencies proficiency. So it's a different way of approaching learning. Rather than being the sage on stage and uh, being the one with all the knowledge, we're actually approaching competency-based, proficiency-based instruction where we enable the students to move at their own pace somewhat and ask the questions and so the teacher becomes the resource person in the room. In doing that, we know that we have to engage the K-12 teachers in learning new teaching strategies so that they are enabled to uh, utilize this instruction to its optimal. 
and the Smarter Balanced will start uh, testing next spring our juniors in the North Dakota K-12 system. They will also start knowing as early as grade three and then at grade eight and then 11 where they, if they're on uh, track to be at grade level on it. But by grade eight, they'll know if they are behind in their science and math areas. They'll uh, also know some other skills. They're looking at four areas they're looking at in terms of proficiency through Smarter Balanced. They will no longer get grades like A, B, C, and D. They will get scores of one, two, three, and four. And the K-12 system is looking at what those scores mean to them in terms of meeting at grade level and being proficient to graduate, meeting the qualifications for graduation. But by grade 11, um, in the spring of this coming year, those juniors will have taken that exam. So they'll know before they exit that they have remedial needs that they can now address in grade 12. It'll be voluntary. We don't have required uh, enrollment and remediation in the state, but it'll be voluntary, but it'll behoove them to address it in their 12th grade year if they have that opportunity, rather than to try and do it at the college level where it costs them additional tuition, um, or it'll be slowing them down in their uh, persistence to degree completion. We're also looking at monitoring the success of those students by our community college faculty and the district staff in the areas of math and, and English. And let me just segue from a brief overview at this point to tell you, three of our five campuses currently have a software program called Pearson. It's a model that was used in Tennessee very successfully where they, within 90 days, went from serving 60 students in grade 12 with remedial math um, remedial education to 6,000 within 90 days. They could, they could expand that process. They have the community college uh, faculty who offer those programs on our campus now is remedial coursework. Uh, working with the grade 12 teachers, the grade 12 teachers would be the resource people in that grade 12 and working with that software program but also our community college faculty are making sure those students are on track to then be uh, successfully admitted to our four credit courses uh, when they uh, approach our campuses. If they're not assessed as college ready, they would start the remediation. If they were assessed as college ready, then they'd go in, be encouraged to go into dual credit courses for Math 103 and English 110, our introductory courses on our campuses, or advanced placement courses. And um, we would also give them additional time in career and technical education, uh, opportunities for, to gain more credits in that area. They might go out and job shadow, and they might also have some more career internships. We're trying to segue them into the world of work so they're gaining the knowledge of the need for soft skills development prior to actually exiting high school or exiting college. We know the world of work does not happen discreetly after high school or after college. It happens oftentimes during that entire tenure of, of education. So I have two circles up here. These are two of the pri four primary domains. We'd have the grade 12, but this orange circle over here, which is hard to read, but I was trying to cover all the bases when it was presented to our joint board, is that this is where we have um, our community college faculty serving as partners to grade 12. We're careful not to say uh, mentoring because oftentimes that means that one has knowledge and the other does not. We're actually partnering in this, in this approach. The community college faculty would also uh, work with our teacher education faculty in our programs across the state in terms of what those new strategies are for teaching. This is one of the areas that differs from Tennessee's model is we're pulling in teacher education candidates uh, work as well as the world of work. We think all four areas of, um, of concentration are important for that grade 12 student before they leave high school. That's where the next banner is, is teacher education. Um, this would be working with the, the programs in our state to uh, capture the attention of our teacher education candidates in the methodologies courses and perhaps other ways um, to pull them in so before they graduate and go for certification, they're familiar with the te new teaching strategies so they can hit the ground in their new job without having to go through additional work. They can be very engaged in it. And I'll explain a little bit more why we're pulling all this together at once and then the world of work. Our hope is in this model, which is a little more complexly um, de uh, illustrated here, is that we would have the 
uh, grade 12 working with our community colleges in terms of monitoring the progress of those students in a computer lab with a computer program that's like almost a digital form of the self-learning packet. They go at their own pace. But their pace is also uh, monitored by the community college faculty. And the teacher education uh, candidates would also be working with those grade 12 teachers. Now this could occur during a summer uh, workshop which would be um, assisting uh, fa or high school uh, teachers could take as part of the professional development and earning credit towards their salary scale. But we think that would be inviting time to bring in the teacher education candidates to assist in the development of that grade 12 classroom. And also bringing in the world of work through the CTE and some of our, our uh, businesses that ha offer internships into that one uh, program in the summer which has all the partners at one place to start asking about how they can contribute to this model's success. Next uh, task force we had is best practices in remedial education. We know that that last model I just showed you will only work for first time, full time freshmen from North Dakota's public high schools. So how do we address the remedial needs of our other populations who come to our campuses? We're looking at what are best practices in English and in math instruction. We're looking at best practices for um, students in the K-12 that could also embellish our first model I showed you, and also adult learners who come, or students who did not come directly from high school but have gone on to college maybe two or three years after they left high school or even later. These are the groups that serve on our best practices. You'll see they're heavily uh, weighted towards the faculty and uh, those who are out of student services who work, work most often with those students coming into our system um, for college who may or may not have remedial needs. But what we know exists now is the K-12 enhancements. There's a Red River Writing Program that happens to help with teachers. That could be also helping embellish that summer workshop where we bring in the teachers and, and have the uh, Red River Writing, uh, the knowledge from that program also applied in our, our summer program. We know that we have on our campuses some very successful programs on uh, not just our community college campuses but across the system, which is tandem remediation, meaning they enroll in the English 110, but also target where their intervention needs to be in the remedial mode, might be in a lab on it. So they're taking credit bearing course in tandem with taking um, an intervention with a writing lab or a math lab or tutorial uh, services that help uh, keep that student on target while they're enrolled in the credit bearing course. There's a new pilot project being offered by or uh, recommended by UND which would embed the remediation and credit bearing course. I used to teach downhill skiing and one of the things I learned from my own development is if I skied with better skiers, my skills improved. Uh, somehow it took away the fear just to try and keep up with them. Well, they're finding in some of their research that if they em embed the students with remedial education with those who are high performing, they want to keep up with their peers. They work harder and they are actually um, achieving within that time of that credit bearing course the skills they needed and would have had to have taken in a separate course prior to enrolling in that credit bearing course. That's a, pil that's a pilot project they want to start this year on it and feed us data both English and in math on it. And then we're having uh, the uh, group is now divided into those looking at what's best for English and reading and writing and those are looking what's our best models for mathematics. This is evolving. This might not all be available to apply in the coming year but over time we think we can keep layering the best practices into different models for those different target groups. And so what I'm talking about is different approaches for different uh, target groups and I've just mentioned these are some of our different pro target groups. Those first time, full time college freshmen who are not enrolled in North Dakota public high schools, those who did not progress directly from the high schools into college including adults and those who may have very, may be very talented but perhaps English is a second language and they're just coming up to speed with it. Doesn't mean they can't do the other work on it. Um, that's our last uh, <coughs> of the three task forces that I'm working with is the admissions index. We're talking about is there may be a cut score but what can we do to assist those students, the information we get from K-12 that inform us of their potential for success. These are who ser are serving on our admissions index. You'll see that um, a lot of it 
uh, it has faculty representation, student affairs who most often deal with the admissions processes as well as a student um, representative on that. We also have a subcommittee that is comprised of a lot of our data experts on the campuses to help mine the data we now have. This is an example of what was proposed in Pathways, where it has the automatic admission. It was the composite ACT, the cumulative high school uh, uh, GPA, and it was looking at a maximum of 15 core credits that uh, would be capped at 15, and then it had North Dakota residency. At this point in time, until we can put the uh, K-12 model in place for remediation, we have no guarantee that being a resident of this state uh, qualifies you as prepared to enter our college without remediation. And so that was one of the concerns we, when we were looking at it as a task force, was to question that. And we looked what would happen if we took all the other data that we are now mining and will soon be able to mine from K-12 and apply that in our, our admissions index. So rather than limit it to everything that's on that, uh, what you currently have in Pathways, with the exception of ACT, you may be able to use that later in life. Those really talk about direct from high school into our system on your high school GPA probably is not of that most, most important uh, indicator if you've been out over 10 years. And so we're looking at also what the smarter balance scores would be. If you've taken the remediation in your uh, 12th grade year and succeeded, we, show, we think that shows persistence. That's a resilience factor we may want to consider, the fact that you knew you had remedial needs and you took care of it in your 12th grade year. We're looking also the grades for dual credit courses, not just did you take them, but what were your grades in them, what your AP scores and credits, number of CTE courses you took, uh, if you took any more of the core courses. We might be looking at some point in time at service learning or internships. We might also at some point be looking at emotional intelligence, resiliency, persistence scores. We might also looking at evidence of leadership. Were you the leader of a club or a, a civic um, uh, program, and there might be other things such as an admissions essay. Uh, we're looking at also on that screen are the scores that you had uh, proposed out of Pathways. We're looking at what we can do now to re-examine some of those. We've looked at the core GPA of 13 or more credits so that we don't um, have a disincentive for students to earn more of the core courses. We, we understand that there's um, a concern about balancing that with additional CTE courses, but we think that 12th grade model of pushing remediation to 12th grade and getting that done and also giving room for them to take additional CTE courses in 12th grade will address that concern. We're uh, looking at um, the coefficients now. We're mining the current data that we have on students who have not needed remediation but have been successful in our system for four years looking at their GPA, their ACT scores, we'll be able to mine some of these other uh, data that's coming from K-12. So we're looking at the full portfolio of what K-12 now tells us about the potential of those students without just narrowing it down to ACT and GPA scores. And I'm uh, hopeful I might entertain any questions you would have. Board members, any questions? You can see what happens when you turn smart people loose. And the institutions, you have a lot of really smart people out at the institutions that are working very closely with Sonia on these task force and putting all this information together for your review at a later date. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, sir, I pre uh, Madam Chairman and uh, Mr. Morton, I appreciate that question. Um, Tennessee has been very successful in this. They're now going to be part of a Harvard um, study in terms of the success that they have now realized in a very short period of time. They had only adopted the model for mathematics. They're now adopting the model for English as well. But in a short period of time of about two and a half years, they have realized, this is anecdotal at present, that's why the Harvard study's coming on board from our uh, quantitative data. They realized a score increase on the ACT between two and eight points in that short period of time by pushing it down to the grade 12. Delaware and Connecticut are now coming on board to adopt Tennessee's model. I mentioned to Tennessee, I've been on the phone quite a bit with Tennessee, that we wanted to add the teacher education 
uh, candidate model in there because we don't want to wait for those candidates to get into the 12th grade classroom to learn those new strategies and the world of work. And they said they wish they could have added that as well. And that's something they'll be considering in the future. So I'm hopeful at some point North Dakota is the one that's written up by Harvard. Has there been a discussion as to who bears the cost of the 12th grade remedial? Uh, Madam Chairman and Mr. Schaff, um, yes, in Tennessee it was a $1.5 million uh, grant that was given out of the governor's office to increase it within 90 days from 60 students to 6,000. And they've continued in terms of money coming out of the state legislature for that. They've also sought some additional monies outside of that for grants specific to um, higher education improvements or reforms. And in the um, in Delaware, my understanding is they're going also after legislative, but that one's not firm yet. They're just looking at this approach now to adopt it. And, and one, one more question. I understand the, the 12th grade remedial. One thing you indicated is, is that it's not mandatory. A student could be identified as needing a 12th grade remediation, but it's not mandatory. So is it still your view that since it's not mandatory, Will we still have to have the same remedial structure at the college level and we've just added another remediation structure at the high school level? Madam Chairman and Mr. Shaft, we would need to anyway. We're only talking about North Dakota public schools. You accept students from other states. Now the contiguous states of South Dakota, Montana, Nebraska, uh, excuse me, Montana, Wyoming, have just adopted Smarter Balanced as well. So the assessment of the need will be much earlier in those states uh, than it's been in the past. And they may also look at this 12th grade remedial model. We know that people are starting to talk about it in these states as well. Whether they adopt it or not is, is their call. But we think that um, we will need remediation because we have these other target groups. We will always have adults coming in, and it may be that they had the skills in the beginning, but it's atrophied. Um, how many of us could do the trigonometry questions we <laughs> were able to master years ago if we're not uh, staying uh, skilled in those areas? And so we think there will still need some remediation, but we think that number will drop significantly because it's been addressed in our K-12 schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And moving on for my next goal, uh, the next goal was a strategic plan and I had handed out to you and I'd just like to walk you through it, a uh, colored sheet that has uh, five columns to it. Um, so we're putting together the process by which we will develop the 2014-2019 strategic plan and what I just want to uh, talk across the bottom of this thing is that there are a number of issues that are playing together and I believe have to inform our strategic plan and uh, we need to inform those activities as well and so it's, there's a lot of cross flow of information. So on the left side, you see the 2020 and beyond and the Succeed 2020 are very, very deliberate strategy, uh, uh, strategic planning processes that the governor, the Department of Commerce have been involved in. Uh, Hess has uh, $25 million invested in this. Ms. Nesset has been part of this initiative. And I am uh, on those committees and the talk is always about education. <laughs> and so if we're going to be talking about education, we need to be at the table and we also need to use that information rather than uh, recreating the wheel. They've gathered a lot of information about what uh, North Dakotans think about education and think about the future. Um, the, the, the strategy overall, by the way, is, is articulated under three columns, uh, people, places, and opportunity. And uh, all of these efforts are driving towards fulfilling those. How do we educate our people and give them a good quality of life? How do we have places that people want to live in? And then how do we ensure that everyone has opportunity and education and, and stuff to participate in the very vibrant economy that we have here in North Dakota? So all of that is informing each other. We're all part of that. Some of you board members are part of that. And, uh, and uh, I'm a part of that as we go on. Uh, the second column is our, our, our current strategic plan. We have that in place, 
and in, um, in uh, July you voted to extend that uh, for one year and so I'm looking forward to uh, bringing this new strategic plan to you in July of this year that will contain all of these components. But that old strategic plan has to inform the new effort as well. Then of course the pathway to student success and I've just listed what the task force are doing and, and Dr. Cowan just went through all of those. Then the Greater North Dakota Higher Education Partnership has been going on. Uh, the Greater North Dakota Chamber has been traveling around the state and talking to business and industry about what uh, they expect from education in the state. And that, uh, all of those discussions, every one of them, I've been to a number of them, your presidents have been to a number of them, they all center around higher education. Uh, what are the needs of higher education? What are business and industry needs from higher education? And so it's a two-way street. And so we've had those discussions. And then the last one is the Joint Boards of, of Education. Uh, we have decided we're meeting quarterly with the Joint Boards. We uh, just had a meeting last week, I think, at, 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 uh, of the Joint Boards. Um, and we're m now meeting quarterly. And the Joint Boards, which is made up of, um, uh, they should be all there, the, the State Board of Career and Technical Education, Education Standards and Practices Board, the State Board of Higher Education, the Department of Public Education. The reality is that the students that walk onto your campuses come from somewhere. <laughs> they come from our K-12 system or somebody else's K-12 system. And we can't be operating in an environment where we think we're starting with a freshman and it's all brand new. So what we need to be is we need to be partnering very carefully across the spectrum, whether it's career tech education, all the K-12 initiative uh, in higher education, we need to be operating across that full spectrum so that the student is transitioning from P through 20 and then lifetime learning after that. And of course, we have a big part to play in that. So on the strategic planning front, we're looking at all of these initiatives that are going on. All of these initiatives are informing each other. We're involved in all of these initiatives and all of that will help us inform our strategic plan as we put it together. And uh, Mr. Chancellor, I'd also like to mention that it is uh, a joint boards, and so I'd like to encourage all board members to attend when they're available. I know that Kathleen joined us, I think, for the first one, but um, I would like to get 100% participation if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Next is the compliance plan, uh, a compliance program. The General Sogsveen is leading the effort to develop a full compliance plan that includes the elements of internal controls, internal audit, and the compliance office, all of which are now becoming operational. In this regard, as you know, Tim Carlson is working to create an internal audit office out of whole cloth. I'm very supportive of his work and look forward to the establishment of that full audit plan, which of course will be brought to this board. Um, Shearson Franzen recently went to a national training program on, excuse me, a national training program on compliance and is working closely with General Sogsveen in creating that office, once again, out of whole cloth. When these efforts are complete and up and running, I assure you that as a board, you will have mechanisms in place to help you manage risk much better than has been a past practice. And the fifth, uh, my fifth goal to brief you on, you actually, it's the system-wide master facility plan. Uh, you recently received a full update on this effort at a board meeting. We are on target for completion with the original plan and timeline for a draft report by review, for review by mid-April and a final report to you by mid-May. The consultant presentations on findings will be available in early June for presentation to other stakeholders, including legislative committees. And finally is the development of the biennial budget. We are on target in all of our budgeting processes. Actions to date include, we have broadly distributed the process and timeline documents in January. We've received input and proposals from various NDUS councils, the NDSA, the Chancellor's Cabinet, and from individual meetings I held with each one of your presidents. I will be sending my recommendations to the State Board Budget and Finance Committee in early April. And I expect that you will finalize operating budget requests then in late April. Um, the only outlier now is the capital uh, budget, uh, which we will work on once we have the system-wide master plan in place. Then the capital budget will be finalized by you in June of 2014. 
And that uh, completes my update on the uh, six goals, unless there's any questions for me. Okay, the next issue, uh, uh, we're going to, um, going to provide you an update concerning the REACT building at UND. Uh, UND's research, enterprise, and commercialization building called REACT-1 was a joint venture between UND and the UND Research Foundation, born in the years prior to President Kelly's tenure as UND president. As envisioned, it was to provide biosafety level 3 and 3E lab space for private companies who would partner with UND in the advancement and commercialization of university innovations and discoveries. It has never been a financially successful operation. UND uh, has provided lease payments for a portion of the building and subsidized operations through other payments so that the foundation could meet its financial obligations. Under President Kelly's leadership, it was decided that UND should purchase the building and take over management of it from the UND Research Foundation. Last January, you, the board, authorized UND to proceed with such an arrangement by obtaining legislative approval, and then delegated to the chancellor the approval of that transaction. During the legislative session, however, there were discussions about who should actually participate in those negotiations, and the law specified the State Board of Higher Education. When I assumed this office in late June 2013, I was not aware that this transaction required special handling a fact I learned on October 4th, two weeks after the closing on all financial arrangements. I have come to the conclusion that we should have handled the purchase of the REACT-1 building differently, and I take responsibility for that. I apologize for any confusion or ill will this has caused the board, the legislature, UND, or the university system. The last thing I wanted to do was to create any more controversy for the university system and I'm very sorry that I did. Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Skogan. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Shaft. Uh, Madam Chair, Chancellor Skogan, my understanding is that the, the legislature, uh, their committee looking at this is ongoing. Is, is that correct? Uh, we, uh, we did meet with the uh, uh, Government Finance Committee and uh, we explained uh, how uh, we had initially viewed that and, and gave our side of it. And then uh, I was told that they would meet again in March. And then we recently received the agenda for that upcoming meeting and what they are asking and we are now consolidating is a list of facilities that are on state owned or other lands that um, are operated or funded through foundations that uh, have financial obligations for the institutions. So we're compiling that list now. And, and the reason I ask uh, Madam Chair and Chancellor Skogan is, I wasn't at the, the last meeting, but, but by following the accounts uh, of the meeting, it's my observation that you, you, you have a legislative committee that has arrived at their conclusion prior to the hearings. And, and if that is the case, and, and it seems just by the line of questioning and, and s some of the information that's being requested, <clears throat> I'm wondering if there isn't some fruit to at least engaging the legislative leadership on the ultimate question of what, what is the remedy you're seeking. Because that's, that's, you know, I understand the process that this went through and, and certainly your explanation, but it seems as though they're digging and digging and digging, looking for an ultimate remedy. And I'm trying to picture in my head what that remedy would be. And <clears throat> at least as a board member, I'd like to know sooner rather than later, you know, what their thoughts are on that. Okay. Um. We, we certainly have a Gordian knot here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's made out of titanium. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thus probably impossible to cut. So I don't know what the solution is either. I know that uh, in, in 
bringing this to a close, I, I felt it was important to acknowledge that uh, we should have handled it differently. Um, but I don't know that that's, that puts anything in reverse. And I, I have been engaged with the legislators in, involved in this, uh, to s some of them at any rate, and have had conversations with them. And it really is that, um, th that these conversations that occurred during the legislative session that I was not aware of uh, seem to, you know, their consternation turns on that. And, and I get that. Right. And, and, and I agree with, with your observation. <clears throat> My concern is, is as we dig into the budget process, et cetera, if, if there's legislators, particularly some of the leaders who are of the mind, and I'm speaking hypothetically here, that the ultimate remedy for them is this is going to affect a, a future capital project at UND, which we've, we've visited those issues before on various campuses. It would be nice, at, at least as a board member, to try to have some ideas to where they're going with this in advance, um, because it could be a bit of a domino effect. I, I'd rather not see that remedy just come in a piece of legislation after we've gone through the budget process, pretty much solidified our situation, whether it's capital projects or otherwise. Um, and so again, and I think you understand what I'm asking, it, I think it, in this case it's best to be as as upfront as we can and just say, you know, where are we ultimately going with this? Uh, because we need to know that for the process we're going through and I'm, I'd rather deal with it now than right. right at the session. I agree. Who would have that answer? Well, I, I think you'd get a decent idea out of, out of the committee. I mean, not, not to say that the legislature can't act on their own later on, but, but I think you'd get a decent idea out of the committee. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Shaft. Okay, moving on to, just, oh, yes, uh, yes, ask Carrie. a question, um, you know, I know sometimes, Grant, you remind us that some of us haven't been here as long, and, and so I would just ask a question, ask the question, um, you know, so I, the way I read the legislative language, um, it's that the, the state board is supposed to negotiate a contract, and um, I mean, when are we allowed to, I mean, I would assume that we can, would we have done it any differently, I mean, is what I'm saying. I mean, wouldn't we always, I can't imagine that we would all get together and try to negotiate as this body. It seems to me this is something we always delegate to the chancellor or someone else, you know, I mean, to, to manage for us. And so I'm, you know, if you could explain to me, what, I, it's not clear to me when, um, when we, were, what we weren't supposed to do here, what we were supposed to do. Is that a question for me? Yeah, well, sure. I, or I, you know, I mean, I know you've. I don't. I don't think we actually have an answer to that. Um, uh, in, in my view, and, and at least my my sole view, the, the legislature looks at this as though they visited it during the session as a very special matter, and and the language of board involvement to them, uh, jumping inside their minds here a little bit, was that this would undertake a level of scrutiny different than what we typically would, as you described, uh, delegate to the chancellor. I don't think that that was necessarily clear to, to board members either, but, but I think that's the position that the legislators who are pushing this, that's the position they're taking, is there was a level of scrutiny that should have come to the board versus our, our normal process. I, I agree with the chancellor in, in that we're at loggerheads on this. I mean, as a board and as a system, we can throw ourselves on the sword on this to whatever degree we can, but it seems, at least in my observation of the process, is that they're looking for some resolve. And, and the issue is, is that the, the transaction has been completed. Uh, am I correct? So the building has closed. That's what I mean. It's been completed. The transaction is completed. And therefore, at least the contractual lawyer in me thinks that it's difficult to unravel that. So where, where are we? Uh, even if we were just for argument's sake to turn to the committee and say, we admit complete fault here. But what do we yeah. do? And, 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 and that's my point, is I'd like to know what they think we should do 
now <laughs> rather than. Well, yeah, and I guess my question was more how do we avoid this in the future? You know, we're supposed to know that this particular thing is to be treated differently. And even then, I, 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 I can't imagine, like I said, the eight of us getting down and trying to negotiate a contract. I, it seems like something we would always want to delegate um, to, you know, the chancellor or the president involved. And so I'm just kind of. In the you know in the interest of avoiding future problems, I'm trying to figure out what we what we were supposed to do. And I just you know based on your experience, I wondered if you had any insight there. But well, nothing other than to say that this was a fairly unique situation. Uh, I mean, it was addressed singularly by the legislature and special language in the legislature, and so it's it's something that probably doesn't have a lot of application to what we do across the board uh, in other matters. My, my personal view is that, you know, there, there are other questions that maybe need to be asked, not regarding the REACT building, but the Centers of Excellence process, uh, you know, to, to a certain degree. We're partners in that process simply because we allow those facilities to be built on our land, our land meaning land owned and controlled by the Board of Higher Education. Um, and we, we have a limited engagement as, as, as far as the activity that takes place there. But one gripe I've always had is that we tend to get hung if things don't go right. And, and I've never been really comfortable with that. And so that opens up an, another d discussion that I wish maybe the committee would look at, which is a broader discussion um, as to centers of excellence. But, but with regard to this, um, it's 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 kind of a singular issue. I th I think it also there's probably a larger issue when we have we have organizations or boards that operate outside. They're not under the control of the president of the campus. They have their own board. Um, you have your foundation board. You have um, the entrepreneurship board at UND. And I'm sure there's there's so many boards I'm not even aware of, and I just I just wonder what kind of risk we take on as a as a board when that when that is going on across the state. Well, to some degree, we're finding that out now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, moving on, item number five, North Dakota Student Association report. Oh, oh, yes, Duane. Madam Chair. Yes, Duane. Can you hear me? Uh, this is a, uh, yeah, this is a, an update on that. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the issue here is, as we've talked about before, is very very simple. The legislature looks at this as is that it's not that uh, legislative intent. And uh, we gave some authority to the chancellor early on, uh, but what happened is when they put the legislation together, they said that the state board was in charge of it, and they have to go before the budget section. Um, and anyone who followed the legislation uh, like this past uh, session. Uh, knew that. They changed this to say that it's a committee of the board, uh, approval to this board was what was appropriate. And uh, that, that's what it looks to me as if that's what they're sitting today. Uh, they say you didn't have legislative approval. Now, eight members would not sit down and, and negotiate this, but uh, as I offered to Larry back in September to help on this, finding out that it was already done, typically we would have the negotiation typically would have come back to the board for approval and go out to the budget section. That's kind of where it's at today. And, mm -hmm. and you know, legislators, no matter what you talk about, when they make up their mind, they make up their mind. And uh, we just need to find what the solution is here to make this not happen again. And secondly, to fix what's wrong now. That's my only comment. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay, and uh, and thank you, Duane. And but I think that as far as the dates that you mentioned, it would happen when we were out at the uh, was it the ACCT conference. So we know it was October October fourth, fourth or something. Then we first had these conversations. Um, but thank you for your input. All right, uh, Jennifer Vetter. All 
right, Chairwoman Diedrich and members of the State Board of Higher Education, thank you for the opportunity to report to you today regarding the North Dakota Student Association's activities and goals. I have about two months left in my term as president, so I'd like to take this opportunity to present to you a full summary of our last meeting and of my goals for the last two months of my term. So first, in regards to Pathways to Student Success, last semester I presented a resolution which addressed the ongoing discussion and development of the North Dakota University System's Pathways to Student Success Plan. This legislation expressed NDSA support for the overall concepts in the Pathways Plan while recognizing that there are issues that students would like to see addressed prior to full implementation of increased admission standards in the system. In pursuance with this resolution passed by the General Assembly of NDSA on September 21st, 2013, the State and Legislative Affairs Committee has continually held follow-up discussions at our meetings. This discussion has been an ongoing agenda item for NDSA to enable all institutions, student leaders to talk to their constituents and voice concerns about the Pathways Plan. <coughs> Following your resolution in January, each campus's student government or other representative body has been encouraged to collaborate with their administrators. The more information that students are presented and allowed to discuss with administrators prior to implementation, the more aware we are that this plan has great potential for benefiting the future students of our university system. I encourage all of you to consider how the success of this plan is to be measured. Is it simply increased graduation rates or is it higher job placement after graduation? Is it increasing our national rankings through IPEDS or US News and World Report rankings? Or is it how highly North Dakota high school students rate NDUS schools in their college search? Today's student leaders recognize that the decisions and policies set today might not impact many of us, but they do impact the future of the schools that have given us our education and many opportunities like the one I have reporting to you today. The second item, second item I'd like to report to you on is the statewide day of service. Our student affairs committee planned a day of service on Martin Luther King Jr. Day back in January. This event will occur for two years beginning this spring and will then be reviewed by the assembly. Projects occurred on more than seven campuses or in the communities of the member institutions and more than 380 student, student volunteers were involved. The projects benefited a variety of nonprofit organizations and we'll be publishing project details and pictures on our website which is ndstudents.org. The third item I'd like to report to you about is research projects. Our state, state and legislative affairs committee has set re research priorities for this year. I've told you this before. And because our organization is not busy with the legislative session, we're researching a few topics in higher education to better understand our lobbying for next year. The first is the state board referendum, which is measure three. And we've been utilizing research and the talking points documents from the system office to inform our report. The NDSA assembly is likely to discuss taking a stance on the measure and what our following action is likely to be. Regarding open textbooks, after a presentation this last month from Dr. Tanya Spillavoy, the NDUS Distance Ed Director, NDSA is likely to draft a resolution in support of legislative funding for open educational resources and open textbooks to be integrated into curriculum. Regarding merit-based scholarships, we have advocated for an increase in merit-based scholarship funding in the past and we are likely to do the same for the next legislative session. To my knowledge, this is also the intent of the university system and we will be happy to collaborate with you in support of this funding. And then the fourth topic is undergraduate research. These reports will be finalized and discussion will begin at our March meeting. I will present our findings and associated <coughs> research to you at that time. The fourth issue is the Connect ND fee and I had Christy pass out a resolution to all of you before the meeting began this afternoon. Our State and Legislative Affairs Committee passed this resolution um, at our February meeting and it states that the delegation of NDSA grants permission to the appropriate leaders to advocate the following outcomes. An appropriate decrease of the Connect ND fee consistent with what was required to support the bond or a clear explanation should the fee not be decreased at all or only partially decreased. The delegation of NDSA is open to supporting the continuation of the bond portion of the fee if a very clear need is demonstrated that would be essential to continue to provide essential services for the fee paying students. Appropriated funds that support the higher education component of Connect ND so the fee can partially be decreased or retired. As Connect ND supports many facets of the operations for the North Dakota, University, North Dakota University System institutions, it is considered to be proper that the state funds be utilized to cover Connect ND as opposed to student fees. And continued support for involving the leadership of NDSA in discussions relating to the Connect ND fee. The delegation of the North Dakota Student Association greatly appreciates this and is willing to put forth the effort needed to keep this communication open and positive. The fifth item I'd like to report to you about is the student affordability study. Partnering with one of my officers, NDSA has developed a survey regarding student affordability which I mentioned at the last state board meeting. This survey is being distributed to each campus student government or appropriate organization. 
The purposes are to determine, one, if student debt is tied to middle income families in North Dakota and other states at our institutions, two, if out of state students acquire a higher rate of debt while in college, and three, what other expenses such as travel, lifestyle, or housing cause higher rates of student debt. We plan to complete this study prior to our March meeting. Six, I'll just touch on the goals for the remainder of my term. Uh, this past weekend I shared these with the assembly and thought it'd be appropriate to also share them with you today. First is to complete organizational analysis of officer positions, requirements, and stipends. Second is to lead a seamless leadership transition following elections. And third is to finish all ongoing projects including our survey on student affordability, our state legislative affairs committee research, our constitution and bylaw changes, and our budget for 2014-2015. And finally, our upcoming meetings. Our next NDSA meeting is March 28th and 29th at Lake Region State College. We'll be holding our annual elections at this time, including the nominations to the governor for the state board member. And at this point, three individuals have been nominated for that position. And our final meeting of the year is April 25th and 26th at Bismarck State. At this meeting, we'll be holding a leadership seminar and approve our 2014-2015 budget. Thank you for your time, and I can now answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions for Jennifer? No? Thank you. Thank you. For all that you're doing. Okay, number six, uh, college, Council of College Faculties, Dr. Munsky. This is the last meeting, the Council of College Faculties did have its session on Tuesday, the 11th of February of 2014. There are seven items I would like to draw to your attention, and I will be very brief. I first would like to thank Dr. Cohen and the interim chancellor, because they've already alluded to what has been going on with the NDUS task force committees of which there is Council of College faculty's representation on all three committees. The second item is the efforts being spearheaded by Dr. Eric Murphy for the creation of a permanent research fund that would be faculty driven. The third item is that there is continuing to be interest in how do we deal with the Family and Medical Leave Act as it relates to faculty. The fourth item relates to the <coughs> efforts by the Council of College faculties to have a faculty-wide, NDUS-wide faculty conference in the middle of October of 2014, and I would like to thank uh, the interim vice chancellor for her efforts to work with Dr. Quijano from Dickinson State as they try, as we try to move forward with her in this regard. The fifth item relates to the ongoing concern of faculty with House Concurrent Resolution 3013 and the council is inviting North Dakota Student Association to work in collaboration with the faculty but as Ms. Vetter has pointed out to me in an email to Dr. Markell, current president of the council and myself, uh, I am open to the idea of collaboration. However, I do believe that our bodies, while they can collaborate, serve very different interests. And perhaps they are. Faculty are the keepers of the curriculum not students. The sixth item is that there was an election of Council of College faculty officers. Dr. Quijano will be president next year. Uh, Dr. Russ is, I believe, the vice president. Greta Paschke agreed to continue to serve as the secretary. Dr. Eric Murphy will be coming on board as the Council of College Faculty's representative in uh, July. And the other positions take effect a month earlier. And the last and seventh final item is that on the 11th of March, the Council of College Faculties 
We'll again have a teleconference and we are hoping to include stakeholders such as Ms. Vetter and the NDSA, but also we'll be inviting our interim chancellor and the vice chancellor to uh, help us through our various agenda items. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Munsky. Uh, where is uh, Eric Murphy employed? Which institution? At the finest medical school in the state of North Dakota. Thank you very much. Okay, Senate, Staff Senate report, please. Thank you, Madam President. We met on Monday and um, we were proud to have Chancellor Scogan join us and give us an overview of where things were. Uh, two major points that we're working on is we are still working with um, the system office on a tuition waiver task force for self-supporting self -supporting courses. And also the uh, state staff senate asked ND PERS that in the future when they have committees working on um, items that are directly related to our benefits and so forth, if we could have representation on such a board and we've been notified that they would welcome our input. So hopefully we'll have that shortly. Um, a couple of things that your staff senates are up to. At Bismarck State, they're developing a staff development agenda where they would address diversity in the workplace. And they're working on the definition of flexibility for the workplace. At Dickinson State, they have coffee and conversations continuing the first Friday of each month. Um, and they, are, they have a staff senate sponsored customer service training coming up. Mine, Mayville State is working on their bicycle rentals for spring semester. I'm betting it's going to wait till the snow is gone, but um, UND is working on development workshops and tours of their staff uh, for their staff around the campus. Valley City is challenging its employees to show their appreciation for their colleagues at Valley City State during spring break. And they have uh, professional development opportunities, discussion on new compensation models, effective FY15, and online accessibility initiatives at Valley City. With that, that concludes my report. Thank you, Janice. Okay, and I promise we are going to take a short break after item number eight, but we are at the point of public comment. I'd like to begin if there's anybody in the audience right now that would like to speak to the board to come forward. Seeing none, is there anybody on the phone that would like to address the board? Okay, thank you very much. Let's take a 10 minute break. set their date for a visit, I believe it's April 28th, 29th, and um, they did say in their letter that they definitely would like to have access to board members, so if you could look ahead to your calendar and keep those dates open. The majority of the meetings will be held, oops, sorry. The majority of meetings will be held in um, Bismarck, I believe, but they want to speak with board members, 
presidents, and I'm assuming uh, they'll speak to students as well with that. Uh, I'm assuming you've all had the opportunity to read uh, the response that uh, I plan to send back to the president of the Higher Learning Commission, and I'd like to open this up for discussion. Madam Chair, as I've made you aware, I, I am not in agreement with the letter. Uh, there are some modifications that I think uh, need to be made to the letter. I've uh, shared my thoughts with you on that. Uh, I, 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 I do want to be clear to the board and to the chair and to the chancellor that, that um, if some of the modifications that, that I've requested are not made, I, I, I will have to rebut the letter before the Higher Learning Commission because I think there are uh, some inaccuracies in the letter. I think there's some language in there that's not necessary. Um, and, and for those reasons, uh, I, I can't support the, the draft as it exists. I, I, I don't think the modifications are significant, um, but, but I can't, can't support the letter as it currently exists. Okay, uh, other board members, comments? Um, I, th I really appreciate where Grant is coming from, and um, I, I thought um, the original letter from Ellen Chaffee ha wasn't always completely accurate, but, and I'm, I thought the, uh, their, their response to our ask of the, their position on measure three was a little sitting on the fence, but I also know that regula regulation and regulators are not perfect. There is, uh, it, there is, it, we strive for perfection, but it doesn't seem to happen. Um, I, um, you look ar around um, our economy and our corporate, our business community, and uh, coming out of the 2008 uh, housing situation we went through, the mortgage backs of securities, and you have companies like J.P. Morgan that have paid a lot of money in fines, and it, they always, it's always interesting, they neither admitted uh, nor denied guilt, um, but let's just move forward. And I, I guess that's the model I, I would adopt. Am I not thrilled about it, but I, I would like to move forward. If there's, if there's some things that would be, that we could get Grant on board, that'd be great. Uh, if, and if, but I would, um, I would certainly trust the chancellor and our chairperson to, to work with Grant to see if we can, and if, if we can't, we can't. But I, I, I think it would be, be great just to put it behind us and move, move forward. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Well, and Madam Chair, just, yes. just to be clear so board members know, the bulk of the response and the tenure of the response I don't have any issue with. It's just that there are a number of statements made that are, at least in my view, flat out untrue. So I will not sign off on a letter that's being presented on behalf of the Board of Higher Education with, that includes statements that just aren't true. And, and, and I think by addressing a small number, some words, uh, we essentially would forward the same letter uh, with, with, with the same response, but just eliminate what I view as some either inaccuracies or untruths. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would prefer that we be able to work that out too because I don't think it's going to be a good day in front of the Higher Learning Commission with the past president of the Board of Higher Education rebutting the letter that the board sends in response. Okay. Other board members? Grant, what are some adjustments you would make to the letter? If board members have, oh, thank you, have that in front of them, as, as to paragraph one, there's a statement regarding the stability of, of the current office and, and having some history with 
dealing with the legislature and the system office prior to Chancellor Shivani, during Chancellor Shivani, and currently, uh, I, I think a reasonable argument can be made as to the stability of the office. Uh, and I don't want to get into personal, personnel matters right now, but, but we currently have a personnel matter uh, that we're dealing with. And I just don't think it's necessary to address that. Uh, if we want to get into the stability of the office situation, um, a lot of what took place under Dr. Shivani's chancellorship was a direct response to some long-time uh, legislative concerns with that office. And I mean, that can be a very, very lengthy discussion. And I don't think uh, the language in there adds anything uh, to what we're trying to get across of the higher learning uh, Commission. Uh, further, there's a reasonable argument to be made that changes undertaken uh, by the prior chancellor were an earnest effort to correct what a lot of leadership in the executive and the legislative branch thought was a dysfunctional office. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of uh, historical evidence to that. And I was president at that time, so I can certainly testify as to that. Um, in paragraph three, this is minor, but it's the use of the word again throughout that paragraph seems to suggest that there was an intent on behalf of the board, either doing my presidency or, or Mr. Espigard's presidency, to move away from regular meetings, from collaborating on key issues, to socializing with board members and campuses, and to hearing from the presidents. And I strongly disagree with that. Uh, and again, I don't think it adds anything to the language, to the letter using the words uh, again, it's to paragraph four, we've, we've, it addresses meetings at the chancellor's home, but quite frankly, the concerns of the attorney general's office, uh, those concerns also were related to restaurants, campus facilities, telephone calls, emails, uh, other meetings at board members' homes, et cetera, et cetera. So just to single out the chancellor's home versus just using the language locations, would seem to be a much smarter way to go. As to paragraph number six. Grandma what page would you say paragraph six, for example? Um, item, item six, six sorry. Oh. I'm looking at items, okay. sorry. As to paragraph six, which indicates that the prior chancellor, uh, it, I don't have it in front of me, but the quote, uh, <clears throat> that the chancellor did not consider the statutory requirement of priority, I just think that's flat out false. Uh, and and I, I think you would have significant disagreement even amongst board members as to that, but certainly my view is that that's flat out false, and I don't think that sentence adds anything again to the letter. In, in number seven, we've got uh, language regarding pathways, and I think we've had quite a bit of discussion as to whether stakeholders were involved or not. And I understand that, that the issue there is whether the stakeholders felt comfortable coming forward. But, but at least as a board member, uh, I don't really want to fall on the sword that we didn't make an attempt to vet this at the campus level. And so, again, just some minor language changes in that paragraph would get the same point across, but it won't open the door to rehashing uh, very different views of this past history. Um, when you get to paragraph uh, uh, eight, I disagree with that indicating that there's an increasingly robust, frank, and professional collaboration. You know, as I indicated at the last meeting, I, 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 I voiced my concerns about some of the transparency uh, issues, and I, and I do respect uh, Madam Chair and her efforts to make the board more transparent, but, but my view on this is as a board member, I've indicated that in my seven years on the board, uh, I have never been in, in less communication or seen less communication between board members, board leadership and the board, the chancellor and the board, et cetera, et cetera. And so I certainly can't agree that we've moved to an increasingly robust, quote, increasingly robust, frank, and professional co collaboration. Um, it sounds as though I want to hog house 
the letter, and I don't. If you were to see the modifications, I'm talking about striking a couple of sentences and, and a handful of words, uh, which basically uh, keeps the tenure of, of, of the letter exactly the same. Um, those are my criticisms uh, and, and areas that I think would need to be pointed out to the Higher Learning Commission. Um, I also have some other suggestions that I think it would imp be important in the letter to give a little bit of background on our constitutional authority and our legislative authority because that seems to run, be an undercurrent as to what they're looking at and, and that's very unique to the North Dakota system and I, I think needs to be more fully addressed um, in the letter. I agree with Mr. Morton in that it is, it is good to put these things to bed. Uh, you know, I've, I've been clear that I think the claims before, that the claims contained in the original complaint are dubious at best. And, 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 but we do need to put it to bed, but I can't, I can't sign off on a letter that, uh, that contains uh, what I think are another uh, inaccuracies or untruths, and particularly since some of them relate to my term as president. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carrie. I just look like I have something to say. Yep. Um, so I think kind of to echo what Don said and, and also, um, now I didn't go through and you know do my own little redlining or anything like that and I think it's incredibly difficult for all of us to agree on the same language. Um, but one, one thing I did notice in looking at this is, you know, I guess my reading of this and someone else can correct me if I'm wrong is that the HLC really wants to know about us, not necessarily our chancellor because we, I mean, we're responsible for selecting our chancellor and certainly he acts in that, you know, CEO role and, you know, engages our strategic discussions and all of that, but but I think what they're looking for is that accountability, the transparency, the deliberation, the vision setting from this board. And so um, I would have liked to see the focus just be a little bit more on things that we're doing as a board. Um, and, and the other concern or issue that I have is, you know, this I think we got the original letter last spring, right? And they at that time they were looking for responses to each of the allegations one by one within 30 days. Well. So much has changed since then that it, it to go back and go through that, I don't even know if that's helpful to them because I think the landscape looks a little different now. Um, and I think that, you know, I would, I would rather just focus on the things that we are doing that would um, um, support the proposition that, that um, we are meeting the requ their requirements for, you know, um, uh, for leadership, autonomous governance, you know, some, that, that we are taking some of these steps to be um, an even more effective governing board. And so I guess that would, I actually, I think I said to someone, I mean, do, what do we even say at this point to respond to that? It's a little hard. I mean, now that they're coming for a visit, you know, do we just talk to them and say, here's what we're working on now? Um, but to go back and rehash things that have changed so much since then, if, if all of that were still the same way, yes, we could talk about it. But I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to, to do that either. Um, you, know, I, you know, I guess I could do the same thing and, and strike that line about, you know, the prior chancellor didn't consider this the statutory requirement of priority. I, I don't, I agree, I don't know that that's very helpful. Um, I, you know, from strategic planning, I would rather just say, um, you know, we're really looking forward to our next strategic planning session. We have a plan, here's what it is. We've been, you know, it seems like every one of these meetings we're talking about pathways, we're talking about our strategic plan. So, um, you know, that would be the focus that I would take, but I didn't do the redlining. I mean. Um, well, well, Madam Chair, I. I'm actually in agreement with, with what Kerry's saying and, and, and generally articulating what my amendments were is to eliminate the, the language that speaks to the past and to say this is what we're doing now. And, 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 and that's my point because I think we've demonstrated as a board that we have different views of what went down. And, and, and I don't think that's helpful for us in front of the Higher Learning Commission to say we've, we, we're on the right path when we sit down and say, oh, by the way, we're really not because we can't even agree on what took place. So, you know, I would encourage board members to at least, at least in considering this letter to give us one quick attempt at just making some minor modifications and put this out in, with some language that we, can all, that we can all agree on because it's gonna be significantly better to have united front uh, uh, on this um, rather than having uh, particularly past leadership standing up and saying, this is what the board adopted, but as a past president, I don't agree with what the letter says. 
And, and, and in that sense, I think it's at least worth a quick crack at trying to eliminate some of the, the objectionable language. Right. Well, and I would agree with you. I don't think that the HLC would care that much how each of us would characterize history. I mean, I think that they're more interested in what we're doing right now. Um, I think I agree too because we have 70,000 plus students who are looking to us to lead them through their educational experience and we need to get back to that. We need to put this behind us and move forward and um, be the board that we're meant to be and to do that we need to stop rehashing what's happened and move on and do the state's business and so what we need to do to get there, let's do it and let's move on. history than the rest of us. Um, would you recommend we do this as a board go through or can we do it in a smaller group? Well, I might maybe defer to Madam Chair because open records and all that it is, I, I've shared my thoughts specifically with her and only with her so she knows the types of modifications I'm looking at. I'm viewing them as fairly minor um, and, I, and I don't think at least in my view, that it, it, they contain anything substantive that, that would change your reading of the letter or the meaning of the letter. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. thinking it's something that we could probably work out pretty quickly. But I, I, I okay. look at Madam Chair because she's okay. actually seen what I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, and thank you, Grant. I, we do have to consider that in uh, Dr. Manning's last letter to us, um, she made it quite clear that it has to come from the board and the presidents. Right. And so the presidents need to be in on this conversation also. And um, so we'll have to, if, we, if we're going to go that direction, we're going to have to do some work on this. I would like for this to not be drawn out. We need to get this out quickly. And I'd like to get it behind us as soon as possible. It's, been gone, it's going on too long as is. Um, I'm getting the sense from board members that uh, you'd like to have a positive spin on this and that we're going in another direction. Uh, but you have to remember that when they come and they interview the presidents and the board members, if our letter doesn't reflect what they're saying, what kind of situation are we in there also? If she said, why didn't you address this and that? Because this is what I'm hearing from your presidents. And, and Madam Chair, trouble with my mic. Ma Madam Chair, I certainly think when they do address board members and, and presidents that they may very well ask those types of questions. And of course, we can't control that. But I'm talking about is the prepared response of the board mm -hmm. that is being signed off by the board. And I think at least in that respect, we need to be unified in what we're saying. Uh, certainly the rest of it we can't control. I mean, what they want to ask uh, regarding past history, they're going to ask. Um, but, but this won't be addressing any of that at that, at that point, so we can't be in conflict uh, uh, in our responses because we're just looking as to what we're, what we're doing moving forward. Madam Chair. Yes, um, Chancellor. And uh, just to repeat what you've already said and just to let the board know the history here a little bit. Um, first, I just want to say personally, I take great exception to what Mr. Schaff was saying about the current conditions in the office. I take great exception to that. And Mr. Schaff, you can talk to any one of these folks that are working up in that office and that worked in that office before I took over and ask them what the environment's like. But secondly, but Mr. Chairman or Mr. Chancellor, I think you're misunderstanding my comments. I, I, I'm not saying that the current office situation is worse than it was. I, I'm indicating that the characterization of what the office was really leaves out a lot of history as to how that got there. I mean, some of that came from my tenure, some of it came from Mr. Espigard's tenure, some of it came through. Uh, Chancellor Shervani, and for a number of reasons. And so just to blanketly classify, and I again don't have it in front of me, but, but you know, the cha chaotic nature or whatever the language was uh, of the board office, it's going to require some fleshing out, at least on my part, in front of the Higher Learning Commission. 
And just the fact that you and I are having this discussion underscores the reason why that language should not be in there. And, okay. and, 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 and because if you're trying to impress upon the Higher Learning Commission that we've got our act together, you and I having this discussion in front of them is going to torpedo that effort quickly. Mm. Um, the other issue is that, and Madam Chair already mentioned, that the letter, Dr. Manning is requiring a response from the presidents and the board. Mm -hmm. So this has to be a joint effort by this board and by your presidents. Right. And uh, just so everybody knows, your presidents have all signed off on this letter as written. So if we're going to modify that this letter, and that's the, the route it appears we're heading, um, then I would ask if you're going to set up a subcommittee or whatever that we get some of the presidents involved in that so that you have presidential input into those modifications. Certainly. I, I mean, I will tell you I would be awfully surprised if, if based on the, the modifications I've, I've indicated that we would have to have a subcommittee. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really not, not anything substantive, but, but obviously that's, you know, for them to determine. Who, who is the response coming from, though? It, it's, it's my signature, but it, it, as uh, representing the board. Now, the last time we had this letter, we did not uh, all have feedback on that. It was, I think, through board leadership and the chancellor that that letter was submitted. So we didn't go through this process on the last one, even though it was a statement from the board, if I recall. Yes, Carrie. Yeah, and maybe that's where I'm confused. Is I, I see in the letter here, the 20, you know, February 21st letter, that the commission wants to review the complaint, the system's response, and the correspondence. Um, and then there's also a report the system repairs, prepares with the board and institutional presidents related to the university's compliance. So what are, what are we calling this letter? Is, the, is this the system's response? I'm, I guess I'm not clear what's ex expected. If, if Actually, the, what we're working on, uh, Madam Chair, is we're working on a response to the July 29 letter. This, okay. is the, this is the letter telling us that they're coming for the visit. If you find the July 29 letter. We have it. And in the July 29th, they wanted us to specifically address the concerns of uh, Dr. Chapey. Here it is. This is what they're looking for, a joint document from the board and the okay. presidents. And they, I think they state quite firmly in there that we need to demonstrate that we are autonomous and not, um, and that we are our own identity from the legislature. And so I think, Mr. Shaft, when you mentioned that legislators are saying this and that, we need to understand that we have to show that we are the Board of Higher Education and are autonomous from the legislature. However, I think this letter states very well that we understand the relationship between the State Board and the legislature when it comes to the funding. Okay. And, but anything that deals with course and programs offered Nobody understands separate. it better than me because, as you recall, I was in front of the Supreme Court as president <laughs> on that very issue. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but, but those discussions come in relation to appropriations, and appropriations is in the domain of the legislature. And so, again, underscoring the point that it's no need, there's no need to even have this language in there to get into this, this discussion. And, and, um, I, I, I agree with, with, with Ms. Reichart that we, we address right on at the beginning of the letter that we have a new chancellor. So it's clear that Chancellor Shivani is no longer here. And, and that should address everything we need to address regarding Chancellor Shivani. Uh, because uh, there's layers and layers and layers, not only during Chancellor Shivani's uh, uh, time as chancellor, but what led up to it et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
my view is is let's eliminate that that language. Well, I, th I think I would agree with that. I mean, to the extent that we need to acknowledge that anything wasn't going well, I think we did that by making the change. Right. I think that's it speaks for itself. Right. Um. I think if Grant and Carrie agree, we're getting close. <laughs> 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 well, but I, I think will it also help us stay out of the weeds? I mean, we just don't want to go there, and and um, we want to focus on the future and all the great things that are happening. And I do feel like it's it's been so long; a lot has changed. It's a period of transition. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, so, you know, I guess I didn't realize that we were kind of doing this unified response and that all the presidents had agreed. So I'm, if you want to just make some changes and, I mean, if you have, if you know what those are and we can work through them, I don't, certainly don't want to be the roadblock. Um, and knowing that they'll investigate more. I mean, it's, it's just the start of the dialogue, right? I'm assuming we'll continue that when they're on site, so. So, so you're, you might be looking for a motion. <laughs> yeah. Or we can table it. Mm. Mm. Well, you do or you don't? I don't think so. I mean, we have to mm -hmm. move. Yeah, we do have to move on this. Uh, in defense of, of mm. Kirsten, um, she was just responding. She's responding to some of the accusations and really um, I, I realize that we can remove some of the language grant but I, I know that it's a response and it probably is pretty uh, too responsive you know some of it can be taken out and I agree if you guys could sit down and see if you can rehash some of the but we also have to address the concerns or criticisms so, and I agree, and I'm, I'm not unreasonable in that respect. And I understand that if there's something that needs to be in the letter, and I, I understand politics too. So, you know, I'm, I'm confident that Madam Chair and I could figure it out. Because I know she could take me in a, in a fist fight, so mm -hmm. I'd have to back down for sure. I think so. But I, I do think that, that we could work it out, and we could work it out quickly. Uh, yes, but it, it we could work this. I know that we could work this out. However, we do have to have uh, the president sign off on this also. And I'm not too certain, Madam Chair, where the July 29th letter actually says it has to be signed off. By the well, I think it is. Uh, I don't think it's probably. Excuse my my wording. It's not signed off, but it is a letter from. On, on July 29th, uh, Dr. Manning concludes her letter that talks about the visit and says, in preparation for the visit, I also ask that your staff work with the board and the institutional presidents to develop a thoughtful and detailed report related to the university's compliance with the criteria and core components I've identified. And my question again is, where does that say that the campus presidents need to sign off? Well, it doesn't say the board has to sign off. Well, I, I think at the end it says I would ask that the purport, report provide, provide have a strong narrative that reflects the collaborative work among the institutions and the board. I mean, I, I think in that sense, the parts of the letter that are not objectionable certainly do that. I just. Maybe as board member, talk, since we're talking about, you know, one of the things they're looking at is to, you know, who's in charge of higher education <laughs> in, in North Dakota. I, uh, I think if it's a board response, it's a board response. What's, what they're looking at, Mr. Schaff, is governance, and they're concerned about the collaboration between this board and the presidents. Yep. Yeah, That's I, what they're looking at. Certainly understand that. Certainly understand that. But I, I, I think that quite easily, uh, Madam Chair and I could figure out language that would, would do what all parties intend to accomplish. Uh, 
Carrie, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, I think what we're saying is that on the important things that matter, that the HLC cares about, I think we really agree. And so let's not even bring anything in that's just going to, you know, create any kind of I mean, I think everyone wants a collaborative environment. I think I'm, I think we all want more information. We're happy to be meeting more often. Um, I was really excited with uh, Dr. Cowan's uh, presentation today. I mean, I think I think we're all in agreement on all the things that are really important here. But maybe I'm wrong. But yeah, uh, Mr. Shaft, I I do have a concern about the two of us um, working on this document without the president's um, involvement only because I think by doing that, we have just demonstrated once again that we are not collaborating with our presidents and that the board is moving forward on this. And that concerns me. And I think that they will pinpoint that during the interview process when they come. Well, maybe I can, uh, maybe I can provide an example of what I'm getting at. Okay, an objectionable statement to me is the statement it says the prior chancellor did not consider this statutory requirement, speaking of strategic planning, a priority. Well, that's somebody's opinion. But it's not my opinion. And I can line up just as many people as the other side to say it was a priority. But did we have a strategic plan that he developed? Well, that, does that mean it's a priority? How do you define whether it's a priority? Well, and, and this is my point. Mm -hmm. So, so, what benefit is that sentence to what we're trying to do with the Higher Learning Commission? I think it was because it was brought up in the complaint, the original complaint addressed that, and so we have to address what was in the original complaint in this letter. That's that being said, one then might also argue that the board didn't make it a priority because the chancellor takes direction from the board. Well, and, and maybe the way to handle that is just to simply restate it to say our board and current chancellor view this as a, a, a high priority. That's exactly I mean, what I've to, been doing, to, yeah. to phrase it in the positive. And so if we just switch we it can, into positive, mm -hmm. yeah. we are viewing it. Yeah. That's right. And mm -hmm. the, we're close. I, I mean, I, I think we're close here. Why don't we just say what the changes are? Let's agree to it. Let's see if there's any problem with it. And let's move on. When we walk out of here today, we could be done with this and move on. Let's make those changes and do it. Well, I mean, we could work, work through it right here. Well, I, th I think you've addressed the major concern. It's the agains and the, um, and bringing it into a positive moving forward right. theme. And uh, I'm, we, do we want to assume then the Higher Learning Commission is going to realize that by saying that we're doing this positive moving forward that we've corrected something that was wrong in the past? We corrected, we, we have it. We, yeah, we're done. We fired the chancellor. We, so. Yeah, so we should. Uh, yeah, and I, I can't say that they're not going to ask Dr. Mm -hmm. Shirley to sit down and say, you know, what would you think of the old chancellor, you know? And we, we don't know that. But, but, but this is what we're saying we all mm -hmm. agree on. And then, you know, if they want to peel the onion further, good for them. And there might be different points of view. But, but the issue is, is we, we have to agree on what's in this letter. And, and I understand, you know, you might say, well, okay, we want to see what the presidents have to say about whether it was a statutory, or a priority of the former chancellor. And we might have five or six of them say it wasn't and the rest of them say it was. You can never get an answer to that. You, you, you can't, and so that's why it shouldn't be in there. <coughs> Most of my suggestions are on the same line. You know, we're again back to a collaborative effort. We want to hear from the presidents. Well, when I was president, we went through a process during every meeting, trying to hear, and I can tell you, you know, at great lengths what I tried to do with presidents, and we were in the the midst of a pretty controversial issue. And so you know, I'm not so willing to sign off and say, this is a new thing we've suddenly embraced because, mm -hmm. you know, we did before. And, and that's a quick fix. It's just mm -hmm. semantics. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like there's a little bit of 
as a lawyer, I, I hate wordsmithing. You know, I hate kind of, re, oh, you know, it, it, but I actually don't think that's what we're doing. Um, and I think this is really, a really important discussion because I think that we are articulating some of the common goals, some of the common concerns that we all agree on, but I don't think we've really sat down and articulated before as a board. And to me, this type of dialogue, <laughs> dialogue is exactly what we are supposed to be doing. And, and so for me, this is, um, I, I know it might feel like, you know, tweaking words, but I think it's really important to know that Grant and, Grant and I can agree on something. <laughs> so um, so I, I know it, it's, it's a little cumbersome, but, um, but I, I, I guess I'm feeling more and more like we're all on the same page in a way we haven't been before um, in, in just talking through these things and, um, um, and agreeing that collaboration is good. And, and for us to be able to say, you know, certainly no one expected things to turn out the way they did a year ago when our year and a half ago or whenever you know, Dr. Shervani joined, um, I don't think this was the outcome that was anticipated. Um, and, and we, you know, when things didn't turn out the way we thought, we could all agree that a change was in order. And I think that actually reflects the pretty, um, you know, a, 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 um, that, is, that is governance, right? And, and so I think that, um, you know, and these things, and those things happen. I mean, I, you know, I think we've recognized that it was not the right way to go and gone a different direction. And um, so I think it's an important conversation and I, um, Defending my tediousness, I guess. <laughs> but okay, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that when we are doing the we, that it is we. I, we are going to be. Well, Madam Chair, in as I've said before, you and I have a very different view of the role of this board. Yes, we do. Mine is reflective of the Constitution. Which so, we just reviewed yesterday in the Roles and Responsibility Task Force. And I know that the word collaboration isn't there. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, but the point is, is that with regard to this letter, I would move that, that the board authorize uh, the, the chairwoman and, and Mr. Shaft to modify uh, the letter so that it reflects the discussion we've had here regarding uh, addressing the positives and what we've done in the future uh, or what we're moving towards in the future and, and try to at least eliminate some of the language that dwells on the past. And I know that's very general, but, but that's what I'd, I'd like to see the board authorize us to do. Do we have a second on that? And then we'll have discussion. You didn't made a motion. I did. In that? Yeah. Is there a second? I would second that. Okay. I think we need some discussion here. Or maybe not. Um, yes. I would appreciate hearing what the presidents have to say at this point. Because if this is to be a common letter, perhaps there is, as Ms. Hoffert points out, as does Ms. Reichert, we are closer than farther apart. So would it not expedite the matter to hear from presidents or not? Thank you, Dr. Munsky. I am in support of that. Are there presidents who would like to come forward? Dr. Kelly. See if this is on. <clears throat> Been following the discussion very closely and I understand very clearly the points that are being made. I think the motion is a very realistic way to move forward in a very short period of time. So I think uh, at this point I would urge that we approve the motion and rely upon the judgment of uh, the members of the board who are dealing with this very closely. I think most of us would, would follow the lead of our chancellor as he works with the two of you in revising this, uh, this document. I think we have a solution. Thank you. I'm seeing some heads nodding. Any other statement from the presidents? Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, I think I could support this motion. All right. 
Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Mr. Hofforth? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Espigard? Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Ms. Nesset? Board Chair Diedrich? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. I think we are on item number 10. Approval of the State Board of Higher Ed meeting revisions. Venue change for March 27th from... Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, uh, Williston State is undergoing a, a renovation of that facility where they usually house us, and so Bismarck State College <coughs> has stepped up. And, and the reason we have to bring this back is because the official schedule is approved by the board, and it's uh, then filed with the Secretary of State. So we want to make sure that you guys approve that change. And then on the second issue, uh, we're looking at a State Board of Higher Ed retreat, July 30 and 31. I think uh, Christy sent out those dates. Didn't you just send them? Not yet. Well, okay. Um, I would ask you all to check your calendars. Uh, it, it turned out to be the only date that we could uh, find uh, at uh, Lake Metagoshi. Um, I hear Steve Shirley has a house we can stay at up there. <laughs> so um, uh, we will be up there and uh, just to give everybody uh, a, a quick rundown on what we're planning to do, two things there. Uh, the Role and Responsibilities Task Force has been meeting. We met yesterday, had a very long, good meeting yesterday. The idea is for the Roles and Responsibility Task Force to have its draft report ready for the um, uh, the full board at that meeting, as well as uh, we're hoping that we will have the strategic plan uh, with the road ahead for us, uh, at least in draft form at that time for a review by the board as we put on the final touches to that. So we are, uh, um, so that, we will do that at Lake Metagoshi. We will start July 30th at uh, 2 p.m. and we will be all done on July 31st at 4 p.m. so people can still get back home that night. Uh, and we will do the two things that I talked about and uh, Somehow there's a supper uh, courtesy of Ken at a steakhouse in Botano. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ken. <laughs> that was a joke, Ken. You don't have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we just need a approval. Motion for that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. for those changes to the schedule. Do you have a motion? I'll so move. Second? Second. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Uh, yes. Okay, moving on to number 12. Approve honorary degrees. Dr. Nadalny? Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, for the record, my name is Raina Donley. I'm the president at Wilson State. Uh, I've come on Wilson State's behalf to request uh, your consideration of two honorary degrees. Mayor Ward Kozer has been the mayor of Wilson for the past 20 years. On June 30th, Mayor Kozer, after successfully leading Wilson through the most tumultuous time in our city's history, is retiring. Through this furious economy, Mayor Kozer served as a pillar of support to Wilson State College. Mayor Kozer assisted with the financing as well as participated in our college's master plan. In my five years at Wilson State, Mayor Kozer has participated each year in our annual strategic planning. Mayor Kozer exemplifies the criteria of the type of person set forth in regard to an honorary degree. Senator Stan Leeson, after a military career, Senator Leeson served in the Wilson Police Force for 15 years until he retired as a sheriff. Since 1999, Senator Leeson has served as our area state senator. Senator Leeson has enthusiastically and successfully supported Wilson State College and North Dakota higher education, both as a police officer and as a state senator. Senator Leeson established a strong partnership between the Department of Transportation, the Wilson State College Foundation, and Wilson State College. Senator Reese Leeson represents and advocated the needs of education, both K-12 and higher education during a critical time in our community. And Senator Leeson was instrumental in supporting Train ND Northwest expansion which plays a critical role in meeting the training needs of our area's growing businesses. 
Senator Leeson exemplifies the criteria of the type of person set forth in regard to an honorary degree. Thank you for your consideration of Wilson State's request. Thank you. Motion to approve. I'll so move. Second. I'll second. Ms. Riker? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Hofferth? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Item 13, approve an exemption to State Board Hol Policy uh, 901. Did you want Laura, to? Who would like to address this? Please. of the board. Um, the request is to waive a part of State Board of Higher Ed policy that requires campuses to prepare new campus master plans every six years. We're currently in that cycle this year to prepare brand new campus master plans. Typically, campuses will engage external consultants to assist with that. Given our system-wide planning effort, uh, what we're asking for you to do is to waive that requirement this year. Um, we'll let the system-wide plan take place. Campuses will still prepare an update to their master plan and feed into the system-wide plan, but it just didn't make sense for us to engage those separate comprehensive plans at this stage. Um, two years from now, after the consultants are done, we'll have a better, hopefully a better and improved process and template and then campuses will be asked to prepare those new master plans two years from now. Okay. All right. Do, any questions for Laura? I move approval. Second. Second. Okay. Christy. Mr. Martin. Yes. Ms. Reichert. Yes. Dr. Jonestead. Yes. Mr. Schaff. Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Okay. On to the financial and facility consent agenda. We have items 14 through 24. Does anybody want to pull one of those items? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Christy. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Mr. Schaff? Schaff votes yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Ms. Riker? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Okay. Academic consent agenda, item number 25. Motion to approve? I move to approve. Second. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Okay. All right, we move on to board policy. Uh, item number 26. We have a first reading for <coughs> two policies. The first one is for 802.8, .8, the internal audit charter. Has everybody had a chance to review? Do we have a motion to approve the charter? So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Any um, discussion on this? I'm sorry, I think a point of clarification here. On a first reading, do they have to approve? Isn't it just oh, the presentation okay. of it? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm moving along too quickly. It's provided for information. Okay. You approve a first reading? And then, we move it and then it's second. second. Uh, never mind. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Yes, it was. And that. Um, Mr. Oh. Morton? Yes. Ms. Hoffer? Or, I'm sorry, Mr. Hoffer? Yes. M Mr. Shaft? One more. Okay. 
Well, the question was, is that typically on a first reading, sometimes the board wants a presentation as to what, what this is. And I don't necessarily need it on this one, so I'll vote yes, but mm -hmm. if that's our time for a presentation. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Laura was prepared to do. Mm -hmm. That's what I was getting at. Okay. All right. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. All right, so save our policy 810.1, appropriated reserve funds. And now, Ms. Glott, would you like to <laughs> present that one? Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, this policy begins on page 131 of your PDF file. Uh, it is a new policy, so I appreciate the opportunity to explain it a bit more fully. Uh, you can see in the uh, opening paragraph in the background information under number three on page 131 that um, the importance of this uh, policy is around creating reserve funds that uh, include our appropriated fund sources. And in this context, when we talk about appropriated fund sources, it's both general fund and tuition. And the importance of doing that is to help create reserves to address unforeseen issues. Some of those, of course, would be changes in state appropriated funds. Some of it would be or could be a change in your tuition because of declining enrollments. Um, also, um, unexpected or unforeseen events that happen at a campus that you don't anticipate. And then the ability to better plan for one-time initiatives that may require dollars to accumulate over a period of time. The other important aspect that you're aware of is um, both the bond rating agencies look at reserve balances and also the HLC takes this into account as one of their measures of financial stability when they're looking at reaccreditation. So it's certainly important um, in many aspects. Um, we, the Admin Affairs Council uh, began this discussion. We looked across the country to see what other states are doing, what might be the best practices. And we found generally that institutions that had a reserve requirement did one of two things. They either required a certain minimum percentage reserve to be on hand at, each, at the end of each fiscal year, or they tied it to their payroll cycle so that if for some reason you did not have adequate income coming in, you could still meet your payroll expenses for a period of time. What's being recommended to you here, and this has gone through the Admin Affairs Council on two or three conversations with the Cabinet, is that we establish a target of five to seven percent. So at the end of each fiscal year, the expectation is that campuses would set aside between five to seven percent of their appropriated funds in a unrestricted or undesignated reserve fund. They could set funds aside beyond that five to seven percent, but if they do, then we would ask them to put those in designated categories, and we've identified those categories at the bottom of page 131. The categories include things such as instructional and academic support, safety, security, accreditation. Keep in, keeping in mind that both in the undesignated and the designated reserves, that the president ultimately has the authority over the allocation and use of those dollars. Um, so that measurement would take place at June 30th of each fiscal year. At this point, we're asking you only to establish that as a target, not as a mandate. And part of the reason for establishing it as a target right now is we have some question that as we move through the pathways implementation, and we factor in potential changes to our tuition model and also potential impact from the admission index, we feel like our revenue stream might be a little volatile for a couple years until we get through that transition and we understand what the impact of those changes would be. So setting a hard and fast mandate at this point of say five to seven percent of our revenues and not knowing where our revenues is, are going to be over the next couple years is rather difficult. So our suggestion would be we set it as a target. That gives the campuses that aren't already at that amount 
It gives them time to get there because most of our institutions already have this level of reserve, but some of them don't, and those that don't are a long ways away. So they need adequate time to plan and get there. And while it also gives us time to ramp up, it also then allows us to get through the pathways, implementation, our revenue stream stabilizes a bit more, then we can come back to you and say, okay, we're at the point now that rather than it being a target, perhaps it's time to look at it as a mandate so that each campus have a mandatory minimum reserve on hand at the end of each fiscal year. You'll also see that the policy requires some reporting disclosure so that if an institution is gonna fall below that 5%, uh, they need to notify the system office and then there needs to be a plan in place in terms of how they're going to recover from that over time and reestablish that reserve balance. So with that, Madam Chair, members of the board, I'd stop and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Laura. Any questions? Madam Chair, Laura, just a quick question. Are you anticipating that this is something then that these balances would be reviewed by for instance, the audit committee on, on some type of a annual basis or similar to what we used to do in budget audit finance with some of, we'd look at, you know, these fund balances at the campuses. Madam Chair, members of the committee, we can certainly do that. As you know, we prepare a semi-annual budget report now and we could certainly incorporate those balances into that semi-annual budget report. Well, so that I, I was more wondering if it's necessary. I mean, what, what do you think? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I certainly think at a minimum it's important for us to tell you whether or not they've met the target or not, whether or not we want to get into the specificity beyond that. Um, I question that because, again, I think we've structured this, and importantly so, that the presidents really have the discretion over the use of these funds, and, and they can move funds between categories as priorities change. I, I guess I agree with that, that, you know, really, it's just one more layer of things we don't have to be in, in, involved with, and we'd just be reported if they didn't meet that, that goal. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Item 27, we have the second reading, uh, policy 302.1. Oh. Oh, do we have to pass? Yes, we do. Okay. Word, yeah. Everybody doesn't know. Okay, do I have a motion to approve that first reading? So moved. Second? I'll second. Okay. Thanks, Christy. Dr. Jones there? Yes. Mr. Hofferth? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. <coughs> Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Okay, now we'll move on to uh, Mr. Sogsveen on our second reading of our policies, 302.1, .2, 0 0.3. Putting our committees back together. Madam Chair and members of the com uh, board, the first three policies are to reconstitute the Academic and Student Affairs Committee, the Audit Committee, and the Budget and Finance Committee. And the only difference uh, from the first reading is shown in uh, redlining on the draft, basically to make sure that the president, uh, that the chair of the board, the president, uh, it, it makes the appointments uh, upon the <coughs> establishment of the committee to make sure that all three were identical. And other than that, they, uh, the drafts, uh, the proposed policies are as submitted on the first reading. So could we actually put the three committees into one, one consent? One motion. One yes. motion? Yeah. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? It only includes um, point one, point two, point three, point two, point three for the, the first three. Also moved. And that includes the new that they've passed out with the red in, correct? Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. So the new red line copy. I second that. Yeah. Christy? Ms. Riker? Yes. Uh, Mr. Schaff? Schaff votes yes. Dr. Jonestead? Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. 
And so I believe at this time, can I state who the members are going to be on these committees? Because everybody has been approached. And um, so for the Academic and Student Affairs Committee, it'll be uh, Mr. Hofferth, Dr. Munsky, Dr. Jelmstead, and myself. For the Audit Committee, it will be Diedrich, Morton, and Nesset. And uh, Ms. Nesset has said she will chair that committee. And for the Budget and Finance, it's Espigard, Reichert, Shaft, and the other Hopperth. And Mr. Espigard has said he will um, chair that committee. He's here for, I think, four more months, but he's done this many times, and I think that would be helpful to that committee. All right, so moving forward with uh, Policy 304.1. This is a specific delegation to the chancellor to approve recommendations for the challenge grants that are approved by the challenge grant committee. And you may recall that two members of the board are on the challenge grant committee. So if, if you approve this policy, you will never see that long list again. The chancellor will approve them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve? So move. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Any more discussion? Okay, Christy. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mr. Hoffer? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Board, Di Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. Okay, Human Resource Policy 20. And that final issue is simply to clarify a other, an other paid leave policy, and that request came from the uh, Administrative Affairs Council for clarification purposes. Okay. Any board members have any questions? Okay. If I could have a motion. I'll so move. Second. Second. Thank you. Mr. Martin? Yes. Ms. Reichert? Yes. Dr. Jelmstead? Yes. Mr. Shaft? Shaft votes yes. Mr. Hoffert? Yes. Board Chair Diedrich? Yes. All right. So then I think we just listed there that we have uh, three other policies that are under review. I don't think we need to go through those. So let's move forward with uh, other business and the President's reports. I think we'd start with Dr. Kelly. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Very quickly from the University of North Dakota, there are a number of campus initiatives that have just started, all of which are focused around sustainable financial planning for the campus. Uh, we are specifically taking a hard look at campus priorities where we will allocate resources for programmatic uh, success across the university campus. And this is uh, across the entirety of the university, including the Chester Fritz Library as the research base for the arts and sciences on campus, all the way across through uh, to the medical school. So this is a comprehensive review of sustainable financing for the various successes uh, of the campus. Uh, we are also nearing the end of the appointment for an individual to take on leadership in campus diversity with all of the, the issues that that entails. Uh, we're very excited and I hope to be able to uh, announce a, a position appointment in just the next few days. And then lastly, uh, our women's basketball team is on top of the Big Sky Conference and I think we're going to get an all automatic qualifier uh, to the tournament. So uh, keep your fingers crossed for the women's basketball team. And Madam Chair, uh, just a compliment to President Kelly. Um, there's been some recent press in the Herald regarding graduation rates and things of that nature. And I just want you to know, I think, I think the university has been doing a nice job of getting the message out as to um, what, what you're, how you're addressing uh, Dr. Light. His comments the other day were very good. And I uh, just want to commend you on how you've been uh, dealing with that. Thank you, Mr. Shaft. We spend a great deal of time, and I'll give Susan Walton, our Vice President for University right. and External Affairs, the credit there. She and Peter Johnson work very closely with all of the uh, information that comes from the UND campus. They do an excellent job. Thank you. Madam Chairman and Board Members, I have a <coughs> sore throat, so I will just say our women also play for a for the national tournament this weekend, so 
with that is Steve's day, so a few more times, Steve. Just a uh, couple quick things. Um, one item, I don't have all the details on this yet. I was uh, been tied up here a little bit the last 24 hours, but uh, yesterday was the bid opening for our Vangstead project, uh, which was uh, our capital appropriation in the 2013 session for Valley City State. Um, it, it's not good news, and uh, it just sort of underscores, I don't have the exact figures at the top of my, my head, but from what the, the architect's estimates were with the project and what the bids actually came in at yesterday, um, pretty far apart. And so I know you have seen this with other construction related projects across the state over the last couple of years and it, it, uh, it's, it's not just a central and, and western part of the state issue that that inflationary pressure is is across the state and so uh, we have to go back to the drawing board with that project it, it appears um, so anyway that's kind of a, a, a downer on that issue uh, we did uh, Valley City State uh, announced a all-time record spring enrollment this year so in the 22 years we've been on a spring semester we have our our largest enrollment this year, and so that's certainly good news. Uh, and finally, I just want to say a word, uh, personally, a word of thanks uh, for the trust, the confidence, um, uh, the faith uh, to you as members of the board in, in the selection early, earlier today. I look forward to continuing to, to build upon that trust and uh, continuing to, to strengthen that trust with the board in the uh, months ahead uh, in making the transition. So uh, appreciate that, and just a, a word of thanks to, to the board members. Thank you. Um, I don't know everybody, and I'm sure not everybody knows me, uh, but my, I'm Mark Wallman. I'm currently serving as Vice President for Information Technology at NDSU, and I'm here for Dr. Bershani, who's not able to attend today. Uh, I just have one update, and that is uh, related to our STEM education building. We are nearing uh, the point at which we're going to go out for bid, and I hope our bids are a little better than yours. <laughs> um, but the process has been uh, a good one in terms of getting the building designed and, and um, uh, taking needs into account of the students and the faculty. And uh, I also recently had the chance to visit with some other uh, folks at other universities in the area, in the region, who have similar facilities, and they have all reported that the facilities have been wildly successful, just had a really positive impact on teaching, and the faculty really like it, and everybody just has been raving about this. And so really excited about the positive uh, opportunities it's going to provide for our students when it's completed. Good afternoon. Uh, four quick points. Uh, on February 13th, we hosted a career fair. We had over 200 employers registered. That is a significant increase to the number of employers we've had in past years. I think it's another indication of the critical uh, situation we're in in this state with the workforce issues that we're faced with. So again, I would hope that we all uh, look at our strategic plans and our budget preparation and uh, address, attempt to address the workforce issues that are out there for our business and industry. As we all know, if we are truly an economic engine of the state, uh, we need to be driving workforce forward because that's the critical point we're faced with in this state right now. Um, number two, last week uh, we hosted the interim uh, higher education funding legislative committee on campus. Uh, I thought it was a very productive day. It was a focus on the two-year colleges, and I think we uh, uh, stressed our point and, and how we can help uh, alleviate some of that workforce pressure that's out there, and I think the legislators were appreciative of our message. Uh, also yesterday, your four two-year colleges, uh, their uh, train ND directors hosted a statewide summit. We met in Bismarck, we had our advisory committee representation, we had legislative representation, and of course college representation. And again, the summit was to focus on uh, the workforce issues and how Train ND is accomplishing and attempting to uh, meet that need. And I think that came out of it uh, three, three points. One is the, uh, the overall model of Train ND is working uh, and understandable and wants to be moved forward. Uh, I think we are looking for some leadership from the system office and from you to help coordinate Train ND as a statewide effort. And I think in the future, we may be looking at a different funding model or, or a look at that, but that wouldn't happen coming into this session. Uh, last but not least on campus, uh, we are searching for an associate vice president of a new position we created uh, Associate Vice President of Student Success and Institutional Effectiveness. With a recent retirement, we've restructured with a focus on uh, student success. Uh, this is taking components from various parts that report 
in various offices across campus and centralizing it into a student success division. Uh, the intent, the measurements will be our increased student success with specific measurements to increase our retention and our graduation uh, rates. With that. Uh, President Dietrich, may I ask a point of personal privilege of Dr. Richmond? Uh, you can ask. I, I seem to remotely remember that uh, your campus received an ACT award at uh, the, uh, what was that meeting we were at again? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, perhaps you'd like to elaborate on uh, being recognized at the joint boards because that is quite a distinguished and national <laughs> movement. Uh, thank you for that uh, recall. Uh, we were, uh, we're very honored to have received that award from ACT and Department of Public Instruction in recognition of career readiness, uh, working with our developmental uh, programming as well as in our STEM areas is the focus that we received the award for. Uh, I thought it was a very nice award. Uh, students were recognized from across the state. Uh, Hess Corporation was recognized as the company that is helping to lead uh, career readiness. And then um, the high school helped me out. Uh, Carrington. Carrington, thank you, uh, was recognized as the uh, top high school and, and we were recognized as uh, one of the top colleges. So uh, all of us will then forward on to uh, an opportunity to compete at the national level for a national award of a similarity. Thank you, though. Madam Chair, members of the board, just two quick things. Uh, last week, our campus and foundation participated in uh, the Giving Hearts Day, which was co-sponsored by the Impact Foundation out of Fargo, and we're able to raise about $14,000 in one day to support our nursing program for, with some simulation equipment. Uh, the second thing I'd like to report on is that our capital project that was approved for this year, the expansion to our Linson Technical Center, uh, had the walls are up, the roof is on, they're getting ready to pour the floor in there and, and, and keep moving on, on the facility and we're still on schedule and on budget ready to be in that facility in August. Thank you. Members of the board, uh, three quick things about Dickinson State. First, I'm pleased to let you know that for the first time in its history, Dickinson State will have an endowed chair. Uh, I had a chance last Friday evening to visit with the folks who uh, uh, helped make that come about and we will ha have the Loman Bang uh, endowed chair in Theodore Roosevelt studies with an anticipated fill date of uh, fall of 15 and for an institution like us that's a, a major step and we're incredibly excited. Second thing I'd like to highlight uh, when uh, when this board asked me to move west uh, none of us anticipated everything that might happen and uh, we took it on and I with your support and I think we've done things correctly. Uh, there is an article in this week's Fortune magazine that talks about international student recruiting, uh, reviews the Ivy League schools, Stanford and a number of others. And at the end of it points out Dickinson State is a place that has done things right and has corrected things. So that's in Fortune magazine's February 24th issue. Final item. Uh, I want to encourage all of you to begin planning your vacation to go west uh, this summer. We just learned yesterday that uh, in the national uh, tryouts, auditions for performers for the Medora musical, one of our students was selected as one of the 12 members of that cast. So I invite you to come and enjoy Western North Dakota this summer, take in the Medora musical and uh, see a Dickinson State student make us all proud. Well, good afternoon, uh, Madam President and members of the board. Uh, just a couple uh, follow-up things relating to the Train ND Summit. Um, there were about 50 to 60 participants. It was hosted at Bismarck State College in the National Energy Center of Excellence. Uh, there will be a report forthcoming in 30 to 45 days or so there may be some budget implications relative to, to that report, but uh, we were really pleased with the uh, outcome uh, yesterday. Uh, we have received notification from the Bremer Foundation of a grant award of $166,000.
Uh, that was actually submitted as part of our communications and creative arts project. Uh, there was some special fund appropriation with that particular project and it'll help us meet that, that commitment that we have with the uh, appropriation on, on the project. And then finally, I just want to give uh, BSC thanks and appreciation to the, to the two uh, employees and one student uh, that we have here today doing the live streaming and they're going around to all the, the board, me uh, board meetings and doing this and the quality of, of the uh, production has been just very excellent. Uh, Dusty Anderson is our video production specialist employed by BSC and he's also an instructor of our video production class. Uh, Cole Bernhardt is actually uh, just started working this week uh, for BSC as a uh, video production assistant. And then the individual to, to the right is Jordan Bitts. He's actually a student in our class and he's getting a lot of hands-on uh, real life um, uh, opportunity with, with, with the live streaming. So I <clears throat> just wanna give thanks uh, to, to your efforts and for making BSC look, look good and uh, that's it. On Sunday, our hockey team traveled to New York to participate in the Junior College's version of the Frozen Four. Uh, and for the second year in a row, they won the national championship, which was a lot of fun for our, our students. And uh, a big congratulations to them. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I just have one item, and that's to uh, convey our appreciation to the board for allowing us to engage in a discussion about whether we wanted to become a separate entity under the university system or a SNAE connected with uh, Minot State. And beyond that, to uh, thank you for accepting our recommendation that we stay connected with Minot State. Um, that was the overwhelming uh, consensus of our faculty, staff, students, and the citizens in Botno. So I thank you for the opportunity to uh, open up that discussion and resolve it the way that, that we wanted it to be resolved. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Um, we're pleased to host you here. We're glad glad you have you here today. Um, as we were glad and happy to host the NDSA meeting on Friday and Saturday, I, I was able to see about 100 just wonderful kids who knew how to operate and knew how were very serious about operations and democrat democratic processes and uh, very serious about improving and working toward the betterment of a higher education in this state. I was just blown away by the quality of those students and we are we should be very proud of uh, proud of those students. Um, it should go without saying that we've been doing a lot of searches here. Um, I'd start with a couple. We've had a special ed search as well as teacher ed search and also a geology search. We're looking for new new faculty and I can just assure you that the quality of these candidates are simply outstanding. We've got um, people who are qualified with exceptional degrees and backgrounds and who are coming in with just an excitement for teaching and learning and scholarship. It's just, it's just very pleasing for me to see that. And we've also completed our search for our College of Business Dean. Uh, we had two excellent candidates and just completed those reviews and just made an appointment uh, yesterday, in fact, of Dr. Morozik, who is now going to be the College of Business Dean, who will bring exceptional skills to that uh, to that college. And since my colleagues are uh, uh, referring to the presidential search, and Steve mentioned the presidential search, I would just be be I'm very reassured that Steve now has that experience to deal with building projects that come under, come out in a, the wrong side of the bidding process. Um, he is now very well prepared to come to Minot <laughs> to experience true pressures on that, on that side of things. But seriously, we're very pleased with the appointment of Steve. Uh, he, I count him to be a very good friend of mine. Uh, he, my, as a colleague on the president, uh, as a president's colleague, he was exceptional, he's smart. Uh, he'll do very well as president of Minot State. And then one final thing, everybody's talking about basketball. Um, I wouldn't start this off, but Bob Kelly had to do that. I, I should start, I should follow it up. But our women's basketball team now won last night by a one point uh, margin. And they're going off to Sioux Falls to uh, NCAA Division II basketball conference and SIC conference championship. Now they're not in the final championship, but they're gonna, they're gonna vie for it. And along that way, um, 
One of our players, Carly Bogue, who is a senior on our basketball team, scored 44 points last night in that game and now has today been named the NSIC, the Northern Sun Intercollegiate Conference Player of the Year. So that's Minot State for you. You know, it's a great place. So thank you. All right, thank you. I believe we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. I didn't break anything. <laughs>